The Dark Cosmos presents The Gods of Mars, Part 1, written by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This is the first 11 out of 22 chapters for this story. We'll be releasing Part 2 next week. This classic dark sci-fi and fantasy tale was first published in 1913 in the All Story magazine. This is the second installment of the Barsoom series, the first of which is A Princess of Mars. Sit back, relax, and unwind for the next several hours with this classic sci-fi story that continues with Carter, pulled into a whirlwind of deceit, mythical entities, and deadly confrontations as he seeks to unveil the reality behind the supposed divine realm. Are you ready? Let's begin. Chapter 1. The Plant Men As I stood upon the bluff before my cottage on that clear, cold night in the early part of March, 1886, the noble Hudson, flowing like the grey and silent spectre of a dead river below me, I felt again the strange, compelling influence of the mighty god of war, my beloved Mars, which for ten long and lonesome years I had implored with outstretched arms to carry me back to my lost love. Not since that other March night in 1866, when I had stood without that Arizona cave in which my still and lifeless body lay wrapped in the similitude of earthly death, had I felt the irresistible attraction of the god of my profession. With arms outstretched toward the red eye of the great star, I stood praying for a return of that strange power which twice had drawn me through the immensity of space, praying as I had prayed on a thousand nights before during the long ten years that I had waited and hoped. Suddenly, a qualm of nausea swept over me, my senses swam, my knees gave beneath me, and I pitched headlong to the ground upon the very verge of the dizzy bluff. Instantly, my brain cleared, and there swept back across the threshold of my memory the vivid picture of the horrors of that ghostly Arizona cave. Again, as on that far-gone night, my muscles refused to respond to my will, and again, as though even here upon the banks of the placid Hudson, I could hear the awful moans and rustling of the fearsome thing which had lurked and threatened me from the dark recesses of the cave, I made the same mighty and superhuman effort to break the bonds of the strange anesthesia which held me, and again came the sharp click as of the sudden parting of a taut wire, and I stood naked and free beside the staring, lifeless thing that had so recently pulsed with the warm, red lifeblood of John Carter. With scarcely a parting glance, I turned my eyes again toward Mars, lifted my hands toward his lurid rays, and waited. Nor did I have long to wait, for scarce had I turned ere I shot with the rapidity of thought into the awful void before me. There was the same instant of unthinkable cold and utter darkness that I had experienced twenty years before, and then I opened my eyes in another world, beneath the burning rays of a hot sun which beat through a tiny opening in the dome of the mighty forest in which I lay. The scene that met my eyes was so unmartian that my heart sprang to my throat as the sudden fear swept through me that I had been aimlessly tossed upon some strange planet by a cruel fate. Why not? What guide had I through the trackless waste of interplanetary space? What assurance that I might not as well be hurtled to some far distant star of another solar system as to Mars? I lay upon a close-cropped sward of red grass-like vegetation, and about me stretched a grove of strange and beautiful trees, covered with huge and gorgeous blossoms, and filled with brilliant, voiceless birds. I call them birds since they were winged, but mortal eye ne'er rested on such odd, unearthly shapes. The vegetation was similar to that which covers the lawns of the Red Martians of the Great Waterways, but the trees and birds were unlike anything that I had ever seen upon Mars. And then, through the further trees, I could see that most unmartian of all sights, an open sea, its blue waters shimmering beneath the brazen sun. As I rose to investigate further, I experienced the same ridiculous catastrophe that had met my first attempt to walk under Martian conditions. The lesser attraction of this smaller planet and the reduced air pressure of its greatly rarefied atmosphere 
afforded so little resistance to my earthly muscles that the ordinary exertion of the mere act of rising sent me several feet into the air and precipitated me upon my face in the soft and brilliant grass of this strange world. This experience, however, gave me some slightly increased assurance that, after all, I might indeed be in some, to me, unknown corner of Mars, and this was very possible since during my ten years' residence upon the planet I had explored but a comparatively tiny area of its vast expanse. I arose again, laughing at my forgetfulness, and soon had mastered once more the art of attuning my earthly sinews to these changed conditions. As I walked slowly down the imperceptible slope toward the sea, I could not help but note the park-like appearance of the sward and trees. The grass was as close-cropped and carpet-like as some old English lawn, and the trees themselves showed evidence of careful pruning to a uniform height of about fifteen feet from the ground, so that as one turned his glance in any direction, the forest had the appearance at a little distance of a vast, high-sealed chamber. All these evidences of careful and systematic cultivation convinced me that I had been fortunate enough to make my entry into Mars on this second occasion through the domain of a civilized people, and that when I should find them I would be accorded the courtesy and protection that my rank as a prince of the house of Tardos Moors entitled me to. The trees of the forest attracted my deep admiration as I proceeded toward the sea. Their great stems, some of them fully a hundred feet in diameter, attested their prodigious height, which I could only guess at, since at no point could I penetrate their dense foliage above me to more than sixty or eighty feet. As far aloft as I could see, the stems and branches and twigs were as smooth and as highly polished as the newest of American-made pianos. The wood of some of the trees was as black as ebony, while their nearest neighbours might perhaps gleam in the subdued light of the forest as clear and white as the finest china. Or again, they were azure, scarlet, yellow, or deepest purple. And in the same way was the foliage as gay and variegated as the stems, while the blooms that clustered thick upon them may not be described in any earthly tongue, and indeed might challenge the language of the gods. As I neared the confines of the forest, I beheld before me, and between the grove and the open sea, a broad expanse of meadowland, and as I was about to emerge from the shadows of the trees, a sight met my eyes that banished all romantic and poetic reflection upon the beauties of the strange landscape. To my left, the sea extended as far as the eye could reach. Before me, only a vague, dim line indicated its further shore while at my right a mighty river, broad, placid and majestic, flowed between scarlet banks to empty into the quiet sea before me. At a little distance up, the river rose mighty perpendicular bluffs, from the very base of which the great river seemed to rise. But it was not these inspiring and magnificent evidences of nature's grandeur that took my immediate attention from the beauties of the forest. It was the sight of a score of figures moving slowly about the meadow near the bank of the mighty river. Odd, grotesque shapes they were, unlike anything that I had ever seen upon Mars, and yet, at a distance, most manlike in appearance. The larger specimens appeared to be about ten or twelve feet in height when they stood erect, and to be proportioned as to torso and lower extremities precisely as is earthly man. Their arms, however, were very short, and from where I stood seemed as though fashioned much after the manner of an elephant's trunk, in that they moved in sinuous and snake-like undulations, as though entirely without bony structure, or if there were bones, it seemed that they must be vertebral in nature. As I watched them from behind the stem of a huge tree, one of the creatures moved slowly in my direction engaged in the occupation that seemed to be the principal business of each of them, and which consisted in running their oddly shaped hands over the surface of the sward for what purpose I could not determine. As he approached quite close to me, I obtained an excellent view of him, and though I was later to become better acquainted with his kind, I may say that that single cursory examination of this awful travesty on nature would have proved quite sufficient to my desires had I been a free agent. 
the fastest flyer of the heliometic navy could not quickly enough have carried me far from this hideous creature. Its hairless body was a strange and ghoulish blue, except for a broad band of white which encircled its protruding single eye, an eye that was all dead white, pupil, iris and ball. Its nose was a ragged, inflamed, circular hole in the centre of its blank face, a hole that resembled more closely nothing that I could think of other than a fresh bullet wound which has not yet commenced to bleed. Below this repulsive orifice, the face was quite blank to the chin, for the thing had no mouth that I could discover. The head, with the exception of the face, was covered by a tangled mass of jet black hair some eight or ten inches in length. Each hair was about the bigness of a large angleworm, and as the thing moved the muscles of its scalp, this awful head covering seemed to writhe and wriggle and crawl about the fearsome face as though indeed each separate hair was endowed with independent life. The body and the legs were as symmetrically human as nature could have fashioned them, and the feet too were human in shape, but of monstrous proportions. From heel to toe they were fully three feet long and very flat and very broad. As it came quite close to me, I discovered that its strange movements, running its odd hands over the surface of the turf, were the result of its peculiar method of feeding, which consists in cropping off the tender vegetation with its razor-like talons and sucking it up from its two mouths, which lie one in the palm of each hand, through its arm-like throats. In addition to the features which I have already described, the beast was equipped with a massive tail about six feet in length, quite round where it joined the body, but tapering to a flat, thin blade toward the end, which trailed at right angles to the ground. By far the most remarkable feature of this most remarkable creature, however, were the two tiny replicas of it, each about six inches in length, which dangled one on either side from its armpits. They were suspended by a small stem, which seemed to grow from the exact tops of their heads to where it connected them with the body of the adult. Whether they were the young or merely portions of a composite creature, I did not know. As I had been scrutinizing this weird monstrosity, the balance of the herd had fed quite close to me, and I now saw that while many had the smaller specimens dangling from them, not all were thus equipped, and I further noted that the little ones varied in size from what appeared to be but tiny unopened buds an inch in diameter through various stages of development to the full-fledged and perfectly formed creature of 10 to 12 inches in length. Feeding with the herd were many of the little fellows, not much larger than those which remained attached to their parents, and from the young of that size the herd graded up to the immense adults. Fearsome looking as they were, I did not know whether to fear them or not, for they did not seem to be particularly well equipped for fighting, and I was on the point of stepping from my hiding place and revealing myself to them to note the effect upon them of the sight of a man when my rash resolve was, fortunately for me, nipped in the bud by a strange, shrieking wail which seemed to come from the direction of the bluffs at my right. Naked and unarmed as I was, my end would have been both speedy and horrible at the hands of these cruel creatures had I had time to put my resolve into execution. But at the moment of the shriek, each member of the herd turned in the direction from which the sound seemed to come, and at the same instant every particular snake-like hair upon their heads rose stiffly perpendicular as if each had been a sentient organism looking or listening for the source or meaning of the wail. And indeed, the latter proved to be the truth, for this strange growth upon the craniums of the plant, men of Barsoom, represents the thousand ears of these hideous creatures, the last remnant of the strange race which sprang from the original tree of life. Instantly, every eye turned toward one member of the herd, a large fellow who evidently was the leader. A strange purring sound issued from the mouth in the palm of one of his hands, and at the same time he started rapidly toward the bluff, followed by the entire herd. Their speed and method of locomotion were both remarkable, springing as they did in great leaps of twenty or thirty feet, much after the manner of a kangaroo. They were rapidly disappearing when it occurred to me to follow them, and so, hurling caution to the winds, 
I sprang across the meadow in their wake with leaps and bounds even more prodigious than their own, for the muscles of an athletic earthman produce remarkable results when pitted against the lesser gravity and air pressure of Mars. Their way led directly towards the apparent source of the river at the base of the cliffs, and as I neared this point, I found the meadow dotted with huge boulders that the ravages of time had evidently dislodged from the towering crags above. For this reason, I came quite close to the cause of the disturbance, before the scene broke upon my horrified gaze. As I topped a great boulder, I saw the herd of plant men surrounding a little group of perhaps five or six green men and women of Barsoom. That I was indeed upon Mars, I now had no doubt, for here were members of the wild hordes that people the dead sea bottoms and deserted cities of that dying planet. Here were the great males towering in all the majesty of their imposing height. Here with the gleaming white tusks protruding from their massive lower jaws to a point near the center of their foreheads, the laterally placed protruding eyes with which they could look forward or backward or to either side without turning their heads, here the strange antenna-like ears rising from the tops of their foreheads and the additional pair of arms extending from midway between the shoulders and the hips. Even without the glossy green hide and the metal ornaments which denoted the tribes to which they belonged, I would have known them on the instant for what they were, for where else in all the universe is their like duplicated? There were two men and four females in the party, and their ornaments denoted them as members of different hordes, a fact which tended to puzzle me infinitely, since the various hordes of green men of Barsoom are eternally at deadly war with one another and never, except on that single historic instance when the great Tars Tarkas of Thark gathered a hundred and fifty thousand green warriors from several hordes to march upon the doomed city of Zodanga to rescue Deja Thoris, princess of Helium, from the clutches of Thancosis, had I seen green Martians of different hordes associated in other than mortal combat. But now they stood back to back facing, in wide-eyed amazement, the very evidently hostile demonstrations of a common enemy. Both men and women were armed with long swords and daggers, but no firearms were in evidence, else it had been short shrift for the gruesome plant men of Barsoom. Presently, the leader of the plant men charged the little party, and his method of attack was as remarkable as it was effective, and by its very strangeness was the more potent since in the science of the green warriors there was no defense for this singular manner of attack, the like of which it soon was evident to me they were as unfamiliar with as they were with the monstrosities which confronted them. The plant man charged to within a dozen feet of the party, and then, with a bound, rose as though to pass directly above their heads. His powerful tail was raised high to one side, and as he passed close above them, he brought it down in one terrific sweep, that crushed a green warrior's skull as though it had been an eggshell. The balance of the frightful herd was now circling rapidly and with bewildering speed about the little knot of victims. Their prodigious bounds and the shrill screeching purr of their uncanny mouths were well calculated to confuse and terrorize their prey, so that as two of them leaped simultaneously from either side, the mighty sweep of those awful tails met with no resistance and two more green Martians went down to an ignoble death. There were now but one warrior and two females left, and it seemed that it could be but a matter of seconds ere these, also, lay dead upon the scarlet sword. But as two more of the plant men charged, the warrior, who was now prepared by the experiences of the past few minutes, swung his mighty long sword aloft and met the hurtling bulk with a clean cut that clove one of the plant men from chin to groin. The other, however, dealt a single blow with his cruel tail that laid both of the females crushed corpses upon the ground. As the green warrior saw the last of his companions go down, and at the same time perceived that the entire herd was charging him in a body, he rushed boldly to meet them, swinging his long sword in the terrific manner that I had so often seen the men of his kind wield it in their ferocious and almost continual warfare among their own race. 
Cutting and hewing to right and left, he laid an open path straight through the advancing plant men and then commenced a mad race for the forest, in the shelter of which he evidently hoped that he might find a haven of refuge. He had turned for that portion of the forest which abutted on the cliffs, and thus the mad race was taking the entire party farther and farther from the boulder where I lay concealed. As I had watched the noble fight which the great warrior had put up against such enormous odds, my heart had swelled in admiration for him, and acting as I am wont to do, more upon impulse than after mature deliberation, I instantly sprang from my sheltering rock and bounded quickly toward the bodies of the dead green Martians, a well-defined plan of action already formed. Half a dozen great leaps brought me to the spot, and another instant saw me again in my stride in quick pursuit of the hideous monsters that were rapidly gaining on the fleeing warrior, but this time I grasped a mighty long sword in my hand, and in my heart was the old bloodlust of the fighting man, and a red mist swam before my eyes, and I felt my lips respond to my heart in the old smile that has ever marked me in the midst of the joy of battle. Swift as I was, I was none too soon, for the green warrior had been overtaken ere he had made half the distance to the forest, and now he stood with his back to a boulder, while the herd, temporarily balked, hissed and screeched about him. With their single eyes in the centre of their heads, and every eye turned upon their prey, they did not note my soundless approach, so that I was upon them with my great longsword, and four of them lay dead, ere they knew that I was among them. For an instant they recoiled before my terrific onslaught, and in that instant the green warrior rose to the occasion, and springing to my side, laid to the right and left of him as I had never seen but one other warrior do, with great circling strokes that formed a figure eight about him, and that never stopped until none stood living to oppose him, his keen blade passing through flesh and bone and metal as though each had been alike thin air. As we bent to the slaughter, far above us rose that shrill, weird cry which I had heard once before, and which had called the herd to the attack upon their victims. Again and again it rose, but we were too much engaged with the fierce and powerful creatures about us to attempt to search out even with our eyes the author of the horrid notes. Great tails lashed in frenzied anger about us, razor-like talons cut our limbs and bodies, and a green and sticky syrup, such as oozes from a crushed caterpillar, smeared us from head to foot, for every cut and thrust of our longswords brought spurts of this stuff upon us from the severed arteries of the plant men, through which it courses in its sluggish viscidity in lieu of blood. Once I felt the great weight of one of the monsters upon my back, and as keen talons sank into my flesh, I experienced the frightful sensation of moist lips sucking the lifeblood from the wounds to which the claws still clung. I was very much engaged with a ferocious fellow who was endeavouring to reach my throat from in front, while two more, one on either side, were lashing viciously at me with their tails. The green warrior was much put to it to hold his own, and I felt that the unequal struggle could last but a moment longer when the huge fellow discovered my plight and tearing himself from those that surrounded him, he raked the assailant from my back with a single sweep of his blade, and thus relieved, I had little difficulty with the others. Once together, we stood almost back to back against the great boulder, and thus the creatures were prevented from soaring above us to deliver their deadly blows, and as we were easily their match while they remained upon the ground, we were making great headway in dispatching what remained of them when our attention was again attracted by the shrill wail of the caller above our heads. This time I glanced up, and far above us upon a little natural balcony on the face of the cliff stood a strange figure of a man shrieking out his shrill signal, the while he waved one hand in the direction of the river's mouth as though beckoning to someone there, and with the other pointed and gesticulated toward us. A glance in the direction toward which he was looking was sufficient to apprise me of his aims, and at the same time to fill me with the dread of dire apprehension, for, streaming in from all directions across the meadow, from out of the forest, and from the far distance of the flat land across the river, I could see converging upon us a hundred different lines of wildly leaping creatures, 
such as we were now engaged with, and with them some strange new monsters which ran with great swiftness, now erect and now upon all fours. It will be a great death, I said to my companion. Look. As he shot a quick glance in the direction, I indicated he smiled. We may at least die fighting, and as great warriors should, John Carter, he replied. We had just finished the last of our immediate antagonists as he spoke, and I turned in surprised wonderment at the sound of my name. And there, before my astonished eyes, I beheld the greatest of the green men of Barsoom, their shrewdest statesman, their mightiest general, my great and good friend, Tars Tarkas, Jeddak of Thark. Chapter 2 A Forest Battle Tars Tarkas and I found no time for an exchange of experiences as we stood there before the great boulder surrounded by the corpses of our grotesque assailants, for from all directions down the broad valley was streaming a perfect torrent of terrifying creatures in response to the weird call of the strange figure far above us. Come, cried Tars Tarkas, we must make for the cliffs. There lies our only hope of even temporary escape. There we may find a cave or a narrow ledge which too may defend forever against this motley unarmed horde. Together we raced across the scarlet sward, I timing my speed that I might not outdistance my slower companion. We had, perhaps, three hundred yards to cover between our boulder and the cliffs, and then to search out a suitable shelter for our stand against the terrifying things that were pursuing us. They were rapidly overhauling us when Tars Tarkas cried to me to hasten ahead and discover, if possible, the sanctuary we sought. The suggestion was a good one, for thus many valuable minutes might be saved to us, and throwing every ounce of my earthly muscles into the effort, I cleared the remaining distance between myself and the cliffs in great leaps and bounds that put me at their base in a moment. The cliffs rose perpendicular directly from the almost level sward of the valley. There was no accumulation of fallen debris, forming a more or less rough ascent to them, as is the case with nearly all other cliffs I have ever seen. The scattered boulders that had fallen from above and lay upon or partly buried in the turf were the only indication that any disintegration of the massive, towering pile of rocks ever had taken place. My first cursory inspection of the face of the cliffs filled my heart with forebodings, since nowhere could I discern, except where the weird herald stood, still shrieking his shrill summons, the faintest indication of even a bare foothold upon the lofty escarpment. To my right, the bottom of the cliff was lost in the dense foliage of the forest, which terminated at its very foot, rearing its gorgeous foliage fully a thousand feet against its stern and forbidding neighbour. To the left, the cliff ran, apparently unbroken, across the head of the broad valley, to be lost in the outlines of what appeared to be a range of mighty mountains that skirted and confined the valley in every direction. Perhaps a thousand feet from me the river broke, as it seemed, directly from the base of the cliffs, and as there seemed not the remotest chance for escape in that direction, I turned my attention again toward the forest. The cliffs towered above me a good five thousand feet. The sun was not quite upon them, and they loomed a dull yellow in their own shade. Here and there they were broken with streaks and patches of dusky red, green, and occasional areas of white quartz. Altogether they were very beautiful, but I fear that I did not regard them with a particularly appreciative eye on this, my first inspection of them. Just then I was absorbed in them only as a medium of escape, and so, as my gaze ran quickly, time and again, over their vast expanse in search of some cranny or crevice, I came suddenly to loathe them as the prisoner must loathe the cruel and impregnable walls of his dungeon. Tars Tarkas was approaching me rapidly, and still more rapidly came the awful horde at his heels. It seemed the forest now or nothing, and I was just on the point of motioning Tars Tarkas to follow me in that direction when the sun passed the cliff's zenith, and as the bright rays touched the dull surface, it burst out into a million scintillant lights of burnished gold, of flaming red, of soft greens and gleaming whites, a more gorgeous and inspiring spectacle human eye has never rested upon. 
The face of the entire cliff was, as later inspection conclusively proved, so shot with veins and patches of solid gold as to quite present the appearance of a solid wall of that precious metal, except where it was broken by outcroppings of ruby, emerald and diamond boulders, a faint and alluring indication of the vast and unguessable riches which lay deeply buried behind the magnificent surface. But what caught my most interested attention at the moment that the sun's rays set the cliff's face a shimmer was the several black spots which now appeared quite plainly in evidence high across the gorgeous wall close to the forest's top and extending apparently below and behind the branches. Almost immediately I recognized them for what they were, the dark openings of caves entering the solid walls, possible avenues of escape or temporary shelter, could we but reach them. There was but a single way, and that led through the mighty towering trees upon our right. That I could scale them, I knew full well, but Tars Tarkas, with his mighty bulk and enormous weight, would find it a task possibly quite beyond his prowess or his skill, for Martians are at best but poor climbers. Upon the entire surface of that ancient planet, I never before had seen a hill or mountain that exceeded 4,000 feet in height above the dead sea bottoms, and as the ascent was usually gradual, nearly to their summits, they presented but few opportunities for the practice of climbing. Nor would the Martians have embraced even such opportunities as might present themselves, for they could always find a circuitous route about the base of any eminence, and these roads they preferred and followed in preference to the shorter but more arduous ways. However, there was nothing else to consider than an attempt to scale the trees contiguous to the cliff in an effort to reach the caves above. The Thark grasped the possibilities and the difficulties of the plan at once, but there was no alternative, and so we set out rapidly for the trees nearest the cliff. Our relentless pursuers were now close to us, so close that it seemed that it would be an utter impossibility for the Jeddak of Thark to reach the forest in advance of them. Nor was there any considerable will in the efforts that Tars Tarkas made, for the green men of Barsoom do not relish flight, nor ever before had I seen one fleeing from death in whatsoever form it might have confronted him. But that Tars Tarkas was the bravest of the brave, he had proven thousands of times. Yes, tens of thousands in countless mortal combats with men and beasts. And so I knew that there was another reason than fear of death behind his flight, as he knew that a greater power than pride or honor spurred me to escape these fierce destroyers. In my case, it was love, love of the divine Dejah Thoris, and the cause of the Thark's great and sudden love of life I could not fathom, for it is oftener that they seek death than life, these strange, cruel, loveless, unhappy people. At length, however, we reached the shadows of the forest, while right behind us sprang the swiftest of our pursuers, a giant plant man with claws outreaching to fasten his blood-sucking mouths upon us. He was, I should say, a hundred yards in advance of his closest companion, and so I called to Tars Tarkas to ascend a great tree that brushed the cliff's face while I dispatched the fellow thus giving the less agile Thark an opportunity to reach the higher branches before the entire horde should be upon us and every vestige of escape cut off. But I had reckoned without a just appreciation either of the cunning of my immediate antagonist or the swiftness with which his fellows were covering the distance which had separated them from me. As I raised my longsword to deal the creature, its death thrust it halted in its charge and, as my sword cut harmlessly through the empty air, the great tail of the thing swept with the power of a grizzly's arm across the sward and carried me bodily from my feet to the ground. In an instant, the brute was upon me, but ere it could fasten its hideous mouths into my breast and throat, I grasped a writhing tentacle in either hand. The plant man was well-muscled, heavy and powerful, but my earthly sinews and greater agility, in conjunction with the deathly stranglehold I had upon him, would have given me, I think, an eventual victory had we had time to discuss the merits of our relative prowess uninterrupted. 
But as we strained and struggled about the tree into which Tars Tarkas was clambering with infinite difficulty, I suddenly caught a glimpse over the shoulder of my antagonist of the great swarm of pursuers that now were fairly upon me. Now, at last, I saw the nature of the other monsters who had come with the plant men in response to the weird calling of the man upon the cliff's face. They were that most dreaded of Martian creatures, great white apes of Barsoom. My former experiences upon Mars had familiarized me thoroughly with them and their methods, and I may say that of all the fearsome and terrible, weird and grotesque inhabitants of that strange world, it is the white apes that come nearest to familiarizing me with the sensation of fear. I think that the cause of this feeling which these apes engender within me is due to their remarkable resemblance in form to our Earth men, which gives them a human appearance that is most uncanny when coupled with their enormous size. They stand fifteen feet in height and walk erect upon their hind feet. Like the green Martians, they have an intermediary set of arms midway between their upper and lower limbs. Their eyes are very close set, but do not protrude as do those of the green men of Mars. Their ears are high set, but more laterally located than are the green men's, while their snouts and teeth are much like those of our African gorilla. Upon their heads grows an enormous shock of bristly hair. It was into the eyes of such as these and the terrible plant men that I gazed above the shoulder of my foe, and then, in a mighty wave of snarling, snapping, screaming, purring rage, they swept over me, and of all the sounds that assailed my ears as I went down beneath them, to me the most hideous was the horrid purring of the plant men. Instantly, a score of cruel fangs and keen talons were sunk into my flesh. Cold, sucking lips fastened themselves upon my arteries. I struggled to free myself, and even though weighed down by these immense bodies, I succeeded in struggling to my feet, where, still grasping my longsword and shortening my grip upon it until I could use it as a dagger, I wrought such havoc among them that at one time I stood for an instant free. What it has taken minutes to write occurred in but a few seconds, but during that time Tars Tarkas had seen my plight and had dropped from the lower branches which he had reached with such infinite labour, and as I flung the last of my immediate antagonists from me, the great Thark leaped to my side, and again we fought, back to back, as we had done a hundred times before. Time and again the ferocious apes sprang in to close with us, and time and again we beat them back with our swords. The great tails of the plant men lashed with tremendous power about us, as they charged from various directions or sprang with the agility of greyhounds above our heads, but every attack met a gleaming blade in sword hands that had been reputed for twenty years the best that Mars ever had known. For Tars Tarkas and John Carter were names that the fighting men of the world of warriors loved best to speak. But even the two best swords in a world of fighters can avail not forever against overwhelming numbers of fierce and savage brutes that know not what defeat means until cold steel teaches their hearts no longer to beat. And so, step by step, we were forced back. At length we stood against the giant tree that we had chosen for our ascent, and then, as charge after charge hurled its weight upon us, we gave back again and again until we had been forced halfway around the huge base of the colossal trunk. Tars Tarkas was in the lead, and suddenly I heard a little cry of exultation from him. Here is shelter for one at least, John Carter, he said, and glancing down I saw an opening in the base of the tree about three feet in diameter. In with you, Tars Tarkas, I cried, but he would not go saying that his bulk was too great for the little aperture, while I might slip in easily. We shall both die if we remain without, John Carter. Here is a slight chance for one of us. Take it, and you may live to avenge me. It is useless for me to attempt to worm my way into so small an opening with this horde of demons besetting us on all sides. Then we shall die together, Tars Tarkas, I replied, for I shall not go first. Let me defend the opening while you get in then my smaller stature will permit me to slip in with you before they can prevent. 
We still were fighting furiously as we talked in broken sentences, punctured with vicious cuts and thrusts at our swarming enemy. At length he yielded, for it seemed the only way in which either of us might be saved from the ever-increasing numbers of our assailants who were still swarming upon us from all directions across the broad valley. It was ever your way, John Carter, to think last of your own life, he said, but still more your way to command the lives and actions of others, even to the greatest of Jeddaks who rule upon Barsoom. There was a grim smile upon his cruel, hard face, as he, the greatest Jeddak of them all, turned to obey the dictates of a creature of another world, of a man whose stature was less than half his own. If you fail, John Carter, he said, know that the cruel and heartless Thark, to whom you taught the meaning of friendship, will come out to die beside you. As you will, my friend, I replied, but quickly now, head first, while I cover your retreat. He hesitated a little at that word, for never before in his whole life of continual strife had he turned his back upon aught than a dead or defeated enemy. Haste, Tars Tarkas, I urged, or we shall both go down to profitless defeat. I cannot hold them forever alone. As he dropped to the ground to force his way into the tree, the whole howling pack of hideous devils hurled themselves upon me. To right and left flew my shimmering blade, now green with the sticky juice of a plant man, now red with the crimson blood of a great white ape, but always flying from one opponent to another, hesitating but the barest fraction of a second to drink the lifeblood in the center of some savage heart. And thus I fought, as I never had fought before, against such frightful odds that I cannot realize even now that human muscles could have withstood that awful onslaught, that terrific weight of hurtling tons of ferocious battling flesh. With the fear that we would escape them, the creatures redoubled their efforts to pull me down, and though the ground about me was piled high with their dead and dying comrades, they succeeded at last in overwhelming me, and I went down beneath them for the second time that day, and once again felt those awful sucking lips against my flesh. But scarce had I fallen, ere I felt powerful hands grip my ankles, and in another second I was being drawn within the shelter of the tree's interior. For a moment it was a tug of war between Tars Tarkas and a great plant man who clung tenaciously to my breast, but presently I got the point of my long sword beneath him and with a mighty thrust pierced his vitals. Torn and bleeding from many cruel wounds, I lay panting upon the ground within the hollow of the tree, while Tars Tarkas defended the opening from the furious mob without. For an hour they howled about the tree, but after a few attempts to reach us, they confined their efforts to terrorizing shrieks and screams, to horrid growling on the part of the great white apes, and the fearsome and indescribable purring by the plant men. At length, all but a score, who had apparently been left to prevent our escape, had left us, and our adventure seemed destined to result in a siege, the only outcome of which could be our death by starvation. For even should we be able to slip out after dark, whither in this unknown and hostile valley could we hope to turn our steps toward possible escape? As the attacks of our enemies ceased, and our eyes became accustomed to the semi-darkness of the interior of our strange retreat, I took the opportunity to explore our shelter. The tree was hollow to an extent of about fifty feet in diameter, and from its flat, hard floor I judged that it had often been used to domicile others before our occupancy. As I raised my eyes toward its roof to note the height I saw far above me, a faint glow of light. There was an opening above. If we could but reach it, we might still hope to make the shelter of the cliff caves. My eyes had now become quite used to the subdued light of the interior, and as I pursued my investigation, I presently came upon a rough ladder at the far side of the cave. Quickly I mounted it, only to find that it connected at the top with the lower of a series of horizontal wooden bars that spanned the now narrow and shaft-like interior of the tree stem. These bars were set one above another about three feet apart and formed a perfect ladder as far above me as I could see. Dropping to the floor once more, I detailed my discovery to Tars Tarkas, 
who suggested that I explore aloft as far as I could go in safety while he guarded the entrance against a possible attack. As I hastened above to explore the strange shaft, I found that the ladder of horizontal bars mounted always as far above me as my eyes could reach, and as I ascended, the light from above grew brighter and brighter. For fully five hundred feet, I continued to climb, until at length I reached the opening in the stem which admitted the light. It was of about the same diameter as the entrance at the foot of the tree, and opened directly upon a large, flat limb, the well-worn surface of which testified to its long-continued use as an avenue for some creature to and from this remarkable shaft. I did not venture out upon the limb for fear that I might be discovered and our retreat in this direction cut off, but instead hurried to retrace my steps to Tars Tarkas. I soon reached him, and presently we were both ascending the long ladder toward the opening above. Tars Tarkas went in advance, and as I reached the first of the horizontal bars, I drew the ladder up after me, and handing it to him, he carried it a hundred feet further aloft, where he wedged it safely between one of the bars and the side of the shaft. In like manner, I dislodged the lower bars as I passed them, so that we soon had the interior of the tree denuded of all possible means of ascent for a distance of a hundred feet from the base, thus precluding possible pursuit and attack from the rear. As we were to learn later, this precaution saved us from dire predicament and was eventually the means of our salvation. When we reached the opening at the top, Tars Tarkas drew to one side that I might pass out and investigate, as owing to my lesser weight and greater agility, I was better fitted for the perilous threading of this dizzy, hanging pathway. The limb upon which I found myself ascended at a slight angle toward the cliff, and as I followed it, I found that it terminated a few feet above a narrow ledge which protruded from the cliff's face at the entrance to a narrow cave. As I approached the slightly more slender extremity of the branch, it bent beneath my weight until, as I balanced perilously upon its outer tip, it swayed gently on a level with the ledge at a distance of a couple of feet. Five hundred feet below me lay the vivid scarlet carpet of the valley. Nearly five thousand feet above towered the mighty gleaming face of the gorgeous cliffs. The cave that I faced was not one of those that I had seen from the ground, and which lay much higher, possibly a thousand feet. But so far as I might know, it was as good for our purpose as another, and so I returned to the tree for Tars Tarkas. Together we wormed our way along the waving pathway, but when we reached the end of the branch we found that our combined weight so depressed the limb that the cave's mouth was now too far above us to be reached. We finally agreed that Tars Tarkas should return along the branch, leaving his longest leather harness strap with me, and that when the limb had risen to a height that would permit me to enter the cave I was to do so, and on Tars Tarkas's return I could then lower the strap and haul him up to the safety of the ledge. This we did without mishap, and soon found ourselves together upon the verge of a dizzy little balcony, with a magnificent view of the valley spreading out below us. As far as the eye could reach gorgeous forest and crimson sward skirted a silent sea, and about all towered the brilliant monster guardian cliffs. Once we thought we discerned a gilded minaret gleaming in the sun amidst the waving tops of far distant trees, but we soon abandoned the idea in the belief that it was but an hallucination born of our great desire to discover the haunts of civilized men in this beautiful yet forbidding spot. Below us, upon the river's bank, the great white apes were devouring the last remnants of Tars Tarkas's former companions, while great herds of plant men grazed in ever-widening circles about the sward which they kept as close-clipped as the smoothest of lawns. Knowing that attack from the tree was now improbable, we determined to explore the cave, which we had every reason to believe was but a continuation of the path we had already traversed, leading the gods alone knew where but quite evidently away from this valley of grim ferocity. As we advanced, we found a well-proportioned tunnel cut from the solid cliff. Its walls rose some twenty feet above the floor, which was about five feet in width. The roof was arched. We had no means of making a light, and so groped our way slowly into the ever-increasing darkness, 
Tars Tarkas keeping in touch with one wall while I felt along the other, while, to prevent our wandering into diverging branches and becoming separated or lost in some intricate and labyrinthine maze, we clasped hands. How far we traversed the tunnel in this manner I do not know, but presently we came to an obstruction which blocked our further progress. It seemed more like a partition than a sudden ending of the cave, for it was constructed not of the material of the cliff, but of something which felt like very hard wood. Silently, I groped over its surface with my hands, and presently was rewarded by the feel of the button which as commonly denotes a door on Mars as does a doorknob on Earth. Gently pressing it, I had the satisfaction of feeling the door slowly give before me, and in another instant we were looking into a dimly lighted apartment, which, so far as we could see, was unoccupied. Without more ado, I swung the door wide open and, followed by the huge Thark, stepped into the chamber. As we stood for a moment in silence, gazing about the room, a slight noise behind caused me to turn quickly, when, to my astonishment, I saw the door close with a sharp click as though by an unseen hand. For something in the uncanny movement of the thing and the tense and almost palpable silence of the chamber seemed to portend a lurking evil lying hidden in this rock-bound chamber within the bowels of the golden cliffs. My fingers clawed futilely at the unyielding portal while my eyes sought in vain for a duplicate of the button which had given us ingress. And then, from unseen lips, a cruel and mocking peal of laughter rang through the desolate place. Chapter 3 The Chamber of Mystery For moments after that awful laugh had ceased reverberating through the rocky room, Tars Tarkas and I stood in tense and expectant silence. But no further sound broke the stillness, nor within the range of our vision did aught move. At length, Tars Tarkas laughed softly, after the manner of his strange kind when in the presence of the horrible or terrifying. It is not an hysterical laugh, but rather the genuine expression of the pleasure they derive from the things that move earthmen to loathing or to tears. Often and again have I seen them roll upon the ground in mad fits of uncontrollable mirth when witnessing the death agonies of women and little children beneath the torture of that hellish green Martian fate, the great games. I looked up at the Thark, a smile upon my own lips, for here in truth was greater need for a smiling face than a trembling chin. What do you make of it all? I asked. Where in the deuce are we? He looked at me in surprise. Where are we? He repeated. Do you tell me, John Carter, that you know not where you be? That I am upon Barsoom is all that I can guess, and but for you and the great white apes, I should not even guess that. For the sights I have seen this day are as unlike the things of my beloved Barsoom as I knew it ten long years ago, as they are unlike the world of my birth. No, Tars Tarkas, I know not where we be. Where have you been since you opened the mighty portals of the atmosphere plant years ago, after the keeper had died, and the engine stopped, and all Barsoom was dying, that had not already died, of asphyxiation? Your body even was never found, though the men of a whole world sought after it for years, though the Jeddak of Helium and his granddaughter, your princess, offered such fabulous rewards that even princes of royal blood joined in the search. There was but one conclusion to reach when all efforts to locate you had failed, and that that you had taken the long, last pilgrimage down the mysterious river Ises to await in the valley door upon the shores of the lost sea of Koros, the beautiful Deja Thoris, your princess. Why you had gone, none could guess, for your princess still lived. Thank God, I interrupted him. I did not dare to ask you, for I feared I might have been too late to save her. She was very low when I left her in the royal gardens of Tardos Moors that long-gone night, so very low that I scarcely hoped even then to reach the atmosphere plant ere her dear spirit had fled from me forever. And she lives, yet. She lives, John Carter. You have not told me where we are, I reminded him. 
We are where I expected to find you, John Carter, and another. Many years ago, you heard the story of the woman who taught me the thing that green Martians are reared to hate, the woman who taught me to love. You know the cruel tortures and the awful death her love won for her at the hands of the beast, Tal Hajus. She, I thought, awaited me by the lost sea of Chorus. You know that it was left for a man from another world, for yourself, John Carter, to teach this cruel Thark what friendship is. And you, I thought, also roamed the carefree valley door. Thus were the two I most longed for at the end of the long pilgrimage I must take some day, and so as the time had elapsed, which Deja Thoris had hoped might bring you once more to her side, for she has always tried to believe that you had but temporarily returned to your own planet, I at last gave way to my great yearning, and a month since I started upon the journey, the end of which you have this day witnessed. Do you understand now where you be, John Carter? And that was the river Ises, emptying into the lost sea of Chorus in the valley door, I asked. This is the valley of love and peace and rest, to which every Barsoomian since time immemorial has longed to pilgrimage at the end of a life of hate and strife and bloodshed, he replied. This, John Carter, is heaven. His tone was cold and ironical, its bitterness but reflecting the terrible disappointment he had suffered. Such a fearful disillusionment, such a blasting of lifelong hopes and aspirations, such an uprooting of age-old tradition might have excused a vastly greater demonstration on the part of the Thark. I laid my hand upon his shoulder. I am sorry, I said, nor did there seem aught else to say. Think, John Carter, of the countless billions of Barsoomians who have taken the voluntary pilgrimage down this cruel river since the beginning of time, only to fall into the ferocious clutches of the terrible creatures that today assailed us. There is an ancient legend that once a red man returned from the banks of the lost sea of Chorus, returned from the valley door, back through the mysterious river Ises. And the legend has it that he narrated a fearful blasphemy of horrid brutes that inhabited a valley of wondrous loveliness, brutes that pounced upon each Barsoomian as he terminated his pilgrimage and devoured him upon the banks of the lost sea, where he had looked to find love and peace and happiness. But the ancients killed the blasphemer, as tradition has ordained that any shall be killed who return from the bosom of the river of mystery. But now, we know that it was no blasphemy, that the legend is a true one, and that the man told only of what he saw. But what does it profit us, John Carter, since even should we escape, we also would be treated as blasphemers? We are between the wild thoat of certainty and the mad zitidar of fact. We can escape neither. As earth men say, we are between the devil and the deep sea, Tars Tarkas, I replied, nor could I help but smile at our dilemma. There is naught that we can do but take things as they come, and at least have the satisfaction of knowing that whoever slays us eventually will have far greater numbers of their own dead to count than they will get in return. White ape or plant man, green Barsoomian or red man, whosoever it shall be that takes the last toll from us will know that it is costly in lives to wipe out John Carter, Prince of the House of Tardos Moors, and Tars Tarkas, Jeddak of Thark, at the same time. I could not help but laugh at his grim humour, and he joined in with me in one of those rare laughs of real enjoyment which was one of the attributes of this fierce Tharkian chief, which marked him from the others of his kind. But about yourself, John Carter, he cried at last, if you have not been here all these years, where indeed have you been, and how is it that I find you here today? I have been back to earth, I replied. For ten long earth years I have been praying and hoping for the day that would carry me once more to this grim old planet of yours, for which, with all its cruel and terrible customs, I feel a bond of sympathy and love even greater than for the world that gave me birth. For ten years have I been enduring a living death of uncertainty and doubt as to whether Deja Thoris lived, and now that for the first time in all these years my prayers have been answered, and my doubt relieved, I find myself, through a cruel whim of fate, hurled into the one tiny spot of all Barsoom from which there is apparently no escape. And if there were, 
at a price which would put out forever the last flickering hope which I may cling to of seeing my princess again in this life, and you have seen today with what pitiful futility man yearns toward a material hereafter. Only a bare half hour before I saw you battling with the plant men I was standing in the moonlight upon the banks of a broad river that taps the eastern shore of Earth's most blessed land. I have answered you, my friend. Do you believe? I believe, replied Tars Tarkas, though I cannot understand. As we talked, I had been searching the interior of the chamber with my eyes. It was, perhaps, two hundred feet in length and half as broad, with what appeared to be a doorway in the centre of the wall directly opposite that through which we had entered. The apartment was hewn from the material of the cliff, showing mostly dull gold in the dim light, which a single minute radium illuminator in the centre of the roof diffused throughout its great dimensions. Here and there, polished surfaces of ruby, emerald and diamond patched the golden walls and ceiling. The floor was of another material, very hard, and worn by much use to the smoothness of glass. Aside from the two doors, I could discern no sign of other aperture, and as one we knew to be locked against us, I approached the other. As I extended my hand to search for the controlling button, that cruel and mocking laugh rang out once more, so close to me this time that I involuntarily shrank back, tightening my grip upon the hilt of my great sword, and then, from the far corner of the great chamber, a hollow voice chanted, There is no hope, there is no hope, the dead return not, the dead return not, nor is there any resurrection, hope not, for there is no hope. Though our eyes instantly turned toward the spot from which the voice seemed to emanate, there was no one in sight, and I must admit that cold shivers played along my spine, and the short hairs at the base of my head stiffened and rose up, as do those upon a hound's neck, when in the night his eyes see those uncanny things which are hidden from the sight of man. Quickly I walked toward the mournful voice, but it had ceased ere I reached the further wall, and then from the other end of the chamber came another voice, shrill and piercing. Fools! Fools! it shrieked. Thinkest thou to defeat the eternal laws of life and death? Wouldst cheat the mysterious Issus, goddess of death, of her just dues? Did not her mighty messenger, the ancient Ises, bear you upon her leaden bosom at your own behest to the valley door? Thinkest thou, O fools, that Issus wilt give up her own? Thinkest thou to escape from whence in all the countless ages but a single soul has fled? Go back the way thou camest, to the merciful moors of the children of the tree of life, or the gleaming fangs of the great white apes, for there lies speedy surcease from suffering. But insist in your rash purpose to thread the mazes of the golden cliffs of the mountains of Ots, past the ramparts of the impregnable fortresses of the holy therns, and upon your way death in its most frightful form will overtake you, a death so horrible that even the holy therns themselves, who conceived both life and death, avert their eyes from its fiendishness and close their ears against the hideous shrieks of its victims. Go back, O fools, the way thou camest. And then the awful laugh broke out from another part of the chamber. Most uncanny, I remarked, turning to Tars Tarkas. What shall we do? he asked. We cannot fight empty air. I would almost sooner return and face foes into whose flesh I may feel my blade bite and know that I am selling my carcass dearly before I go down to that eternal oblivion which is evidently the fairest and most desirable eternity that mortal man has the right to hope for. If, as you say, we cannot fight empty air, Tars Tarkas, I replied, neither, on the other hand, can empty air fight us. I who have faced and conquered in my time thousands of sinewy warriors and tempered blades, shall not be turned back by wind, nor no more shall you, Thark. But unseen voices may emanate from unseen and unseeable creatures who wield invisible blades, answered the green warrior. Rot! Tars Tarkas! I cried. Those voices come from beings as real as you or as I. In their veins flows lifeblood that may be let as easily as ours, 
and the fact that they remain invisible to us is the best proof to my mind that they are mortal, nor overly courageous mortals at that. Think you, Tars Tarkas, that John Carter will fly at the first shriek of a cowardly foe who dare not come out into the open and face a good blade? I had spoken in a loud voice that there might be no question that our would-be terrorizers should hear me, for I was tiring of this nerve-wracking fiasco. It had occurred to me, too, that the whole business was but a plan to frighten us back into the valley of death from which we had escaped, that we might be quickly disposed of by the savage creatures there. For a long period there was silence, then of a sudden a soft, stealthy sound behind me caused me to turn suddenly to behold a great many-legged banth creeping sinuously upon me. The banth is a fierce beast of prey that roams the low hills surrounding the dead seas of ancient Mars. Like nearly all Martian animals, it is almost hairless, having only a great bristly mane about its thick neck. Its long, lithe body is supported by ten powerful legs. Its enormous jaws are equipped, like those of the calot or Martian hound, with several rows of long, needle-like fangs. Its mouth reaches to a point far back of its tiny ears, while its enormous protruding eyes of green add the last touch of terror to its awful aspect. As it crept toward me, it lashed its powerful tail against its yellow sides, and when it saw that it was discovered, it emitted the terrifying roar which often freezes its prey into momentary paralysis in the instant that it makes its spring. And so it launched its great bulk toward me, but its mighty voice had held no paralyzing terrors for me, and it met cold steel instead of the tender flesh its cruel jaws gaped so widely to engulf. An instant later, I drew my blade from the still heart of this great Barsoomian lion, and turning toward Tars Tarkas, was surprised to see him facing a similar monster. No sooner had he dispatched his than I, turning as though drawn by the instinct of my guardian subconscious mind, beheld another of the savage denizens of the Martian wilds leaping across the chamber toward me. From then on, for the better part of an hour, one hideous creature after another was launched upon us, springing apparently from the empty air about us. Tars Tarkas was satisfied. Here was something tangible that he could cut and slash with his great blade, while I, for my part, may say that the diversion was a marked improvement over the uncanny voices from unseen lips. That there was nothing supernatural about our new foes was well evidenced by their howls of rage and pain as they felt the sharp steel at their vitals and the very real blood which flowed from their severed arteries as they died the real death. I noticed during the period of this new persecution that the beasts appeared only when our backs were turned. We never saw one really materialize from thin air nor did I for an instant sufficiently lose my excellent reasoning faculties to be once deluded into the belief that the beasts came into the room other than through some concealed and well-contrived doorway. Among the ornaments of Tars Tarkas's leather harness, which is the only manner of clothing worn by Martians other than silk capes and robes of silk and fur for protection from the cold after dark, was a small mirror about the bigness of a lady's hand glass which hung midway between his shoulders and his waist against his broad back. Once, as he stood looking down at a newly fallen antagonist, my eyes happened to fall upon this mirror, and in its shiny surface I saw pictured a sight that caused me to whisper, Move not, Tars Tarkas, move not a muscle! He did not ask why, but stood like a graven image while my eyes watched the strange thing that meant so much to us. What I saw was the quick movement of a section of the wall behind me. It was turning upon pivots, and with it a section of the floor directly in front of it was turning. It was as though you placed a visiting card upon end on a silver dollar that you had laid flat upon a table, so that the edge of the card perfectly bisected the surface of the coin. The card might represent the section of the wall that turned, and the silver dollar the section of the floor. Both were so nicely fitted into the adjacent portions of the floor and wall that no crack had been noticeable in the dim light of the chamber. 
As the turn was half completed, a great beast was revealed sitting upon its haunches upon that part of the revolving floor that had been on the opposite side before the wall commenced to move. When the section stopped, the beast was facing toward me on our side of the partition. It was very simple. But what had interested me most was the sight that the half-turned section had presented through the opening that it had made. A great chamber, well lighted, in which were several men and women chained to the wall, and in front of them, evidently directing and operating the movement of the secret doorway. A wicked-faced man, neither red as are the red men of Mars, nor green as are the green men, but white, like myself, with a great mass of flowing yellow hair. The prisoners behind him were red Martians. Chained with them were a number of fierce beasts, such as had been turned upon us, and others equally as ferocious. As I turned to meet my new foe, it was with a heart considerably lightened. Watch the wall at your end of the chamber, Tars Tarkas, I cautioned. It is through secret doorways in the wall that the brutes are loosed upon us. I was very close to him and spoke in a low whisper that my knowledge of their secret might not be disclosed to our tormentors. As long as we remained each facing an opposite end of the apartment, no further attacks were made upon us, so it was quite clear to me that the partitions were in some way pierced that our actions might be observed from without. At length, a plan of action occurred to me, and backing quite close to Tars Tarkas, I unfolded my scheme in a low whisper keeping my eyes still glued upon my end of the room. The great Thark grunted his assent to my proposition when I had done, and in accordance with my plan, commenced backing toward the wall which I faced while I advanced slowly ahead of him. When we had reached a point some ten feet from the secret doorway, I halted my companion, and cautioning him to remain absolutely motionless until I gave the prearranged signal I quickly turned my back to the door through which I could almost feel the burning and baleful eyes of our would-be executioner. Instantly, my own eyes sought the mirror upon Tars Tarkas's back, and in another second I was closely watching the section of the wall which had been disgorging its savage terrors upon us. I had not long to wait, for presently the golden surface commenced to move rapidly, Scarcely had it started than I gave the signal to Tars Tarkas, simultaneously springing for the receding half of the pivoting door. In like manner, the Thark wheeled and leaped for the opening being made by the inswinging section. A single bound carried me completely through into the adjoining room and brought me face to face with the fellow whose cruel face I had seen before. He was about my own height and well-muscled, and in every outward detail moulded precisely as are earthmen. At his side hung a long sword, a short sword, a dagger, and one of the destructive radium revolvers that are common upon Mars. The fact that I was armed only with a long sword, and so, according to the laws and ethics of battle everywhere upon Barsoom, should only have been met with a similar or lesser weapon, seemed to have no effect upon the moral sense of my enemy for he whipped out his revolver ere I scarce had touched the floor by his side, but an uppercut from my longsword sent it flying from his grasp before he could discharge it. Instantly he drew his longsword, and thus evenly armed we set to in earnest for one of the closest battles I ever have fought. The fellow was a marvellous swordsman, and evidently in practice, while I had not gripped the hilt of a sword for ten long years before that morning, but it did not take me long to fall easily into my fighting stride, so that in a few minutes the man began to realize that he had at last met his match. His face became livid with rage as he found my guard impregnable, while blood flowed from a dozen minor wounds upon his face and body. "'Who are you, white man?' he hissed. "'That you are no Barsoomian from the outer world is evident from your color, and you are not of us.' His last statement was almost a question. What if I were from the Temple of Issus? I hazarded on a wild guess. Fate for Fend, he exclaimed, his face going white under the blood that now nearly covered it. I did not know how to follow up my lead, but I carefully laid the idea away for future use should circumstances require it. 
His answer indicated that for all he knew I might be from the Temple of Issus, and in it were men like unto myself, and either this man feared the inmates of the temple, or else he held their persons or their power in such reverence that he trembled to think of the harm and indignities he had heaped upon one of them. But my present business with him was of a different nature than that which requires any considerable abstract reasoning. It was to get my sword between his ribs, and this I succeeded in doing within the next few seconds, nor was I an instant too soon. The chained prisoners had been watching the combat in tense silence. Not a sound had fallen in the room other than the clashing of our contending blades, the soft shuffling of our naked feet, and the few whispered words we had hissed at each other through clenched teeth the while we continued our mortal duel. But as the body of my antagonist sank an inert mass to the floor, a cry of warning broke from one of the female prisoners. Turn! Turn! Behind you! She shrieked, and as I wheeled at the first note of her shrill cry, I found myself facing a second man of the same race as he who lay at my feet. The fellow had crept stealthily from a dark corridor and was almost upon me with raised sword ere I saw him. Tars Tarkas was nowhere in sight, and the secret panel in the wall through which I had come was closed. How I wished that he were by my side now. I had fought almost continuously for many hours. I had passed through such experiences and adventures as must sap the vitality of man. And with all this I had not eaten for nearly twenty-four hours, nor slept. I was fagged out, and for the first time in years felt a question as to my ability to cope with an antagonist but there was naught else for it than to engage my man, and that as quickly and ferociously as lay in me, for my only salvation was to rush him off his feet by the impetuosity of my attack. I could not hope to win a long, drawn-out battle, but the fellow was evidently of another mind, for he backed and parried and parried and sidestepped until I was almost completely fagged from the exertion of attempting to finish him. He was a more adroit swordsman, if possible, than my previous foe and I must admit that he led me a pretty chase, and in the end came near to making a sorry fool of me, and a dead one into the bargain. I could feel myself growing weaker and weaker, until at length objects commenced to blur before my eyes, and I staggered and blundered about more asleep than awake, and then it was that he worked his pretty little coup that came near to losing me my life. He had backed me around so that I stood in front of the corpse of his fellow, and then he rushed me suddenly, so that I was forced back upon it, and as my heel struck it, the impetus of my body flung me backward across the dead man. My head struck the hard pavement with a resounding whack, and to that alone I owe my life, for it cleared my brain, and the pain roused my temper, so that I was equal for the moment to tearing my enemy to pieces with my bare hands, and I verily believe that I should have attempted it had not my right hand in the act of raising my body from the ground, come in contact with a bit of cold metal. As the eyes of the layman, so is the hand of the fighting man when it comes in contact with an implement of his vocation. And thus I did not need to look or reason to know that the dead man's revolver, lying where it had fallen when I struck it from his grasp, was at my disposal. The fellow whose ruse had put me down was springing toward me, the point of his gleaming blade directed straight at my heart, and as he came, there rang from his lips the cruel and mocking peal of laughter that I had heard within the chamber of mystery. And so he died, his thin lips curled in the snarl of his hateful laugh, and a bullet from the revolver of his dead companion bursting in his heart. His body, borne by the impetus of his headlong rush, plunged upon me, the hilt of his sword must have struck my head, for with the impact of the corpse I lost consciousness. Chapter 4 Thuvia It was the sound of conflict that aroused me once more to the realities of life. For a moment, I could neither place my surroundings nor locate the sounds which had aroused me. And then, from beyond the blank wall beside which I lay, I heard the shuffling of feet the snarling of grim beasts, the clank of metal accoutrements, and the heavy breathing of a man. 
As I rose to my feet, I glanced hurriedly about the chamber in which I had just encountered such a warm reception. The prisoners and the savage brutes rested in their chains by the opposite wall, eyeing me with varying expressions of curiosity, sullen rage, surprise and hope. The latter emotion seemed plainly evident upon the handsome and intelligent face of the young red Martian woman whose cry of warning had been instrumental in saving my life. She was the perfect type of that remarkably beautiful race whose outward appearance is identical with the more godlike races of Earthmen, except that this higher race of Martians is of a light reddish copper color. As she was entirely unadorned, I couldn't even guess her station in life, though it was evident that she was either a prisoner or slave in her present environment. It was several seconds before the sounds upon the opposite side of the partition jolted my slowly returning faculties into a realization of their probable import, and then of a sudden I grasped the fact that they were caused by Tars Tarkas in what was evidently a desperate struggle with wild beasts or savage men. With a cry of encouragement, I threw my weight against the secret door, but as well have essayed the down-hurling of the cliffs themselves. Then I sought feverishly for the secret of the revolving panel, but my search was fruitless, and I was about to raise my longsword against the sullen gold when the young woman prisoner called out to me, Save thy sword, O mighty warrior, for thou shalt need it more where it will avail to some purpose. Shatter it not against senseless metal, which yields better to the lightest finger touch of one who knows its secret. Know you the secret of it then? I asked. Yes. Release me, and I will give you entrance to the other horror chamber if you wish. The keys to my fetters are upon the first dead of thy foemen. But why would you return to face again the fierce banth, or whatever other form of destruction they have loosed within that awful trap? Because my friend fights there alone, I answered, as I hastily sought and found the keys upon the carcass of the dead custodian of this grim chamber of horrors. There were many keys upon the oval ring, but the fair Martian maid quickly selected that which sprung the great lock at her waist, and freed, she hurried toward the secret panel. Again, she sought out a key upon the ring. This time, a slender, needle-like affair which she inserted in an almost invisible hole in the wall. Instantly, the door swung upon its pivot, and the contiguous section of the floor upon which I was standing carried me with it into the chamber where Tars Tarkas fought. The great Thark stood with his back against an angle of the walls while facing him in a semicircle, a half-dozen huge monsters crouched waiting for an opening. Their blood-streaked heads and shoulders testified to the cause of their wariness, as well as to the swordsmanship of the green warrior whose glossy hide bore the same mute but eloquent witness to the ferocity of the attacks that he had so far withstood. Sharp talons and cruel fangs had torn leg, arm and breast, literally to ribbons. So weak was he from continued exertion and loss of blood that but for the supporting wall I doubt that he even could have stood erect. But with the tenacity and indomitable courage of his kind, he still faced his cruel and relentless foes, the personification of that ancient proverb of his tribe. Leave to a thark his head and one hand, and he may yet conquer. As he saw me enter, a grim smile touched those grim lips of his. But whether the smile signified relief or merely amusement at the sight of my own bloody and disheveled condition, I do not know. As I was about to spring into the conflict with my sharp longsword, I felt a gentle hand upon my shoulder, and turning found, to my surprise, that the young woman had followed me into the chamber. Wait, she whispered, leave them to me, and pushing me advanced, all defenseless and unarmed, upon the snarling banths. When quite close to them, she spoke a single Martian word in low but peremptory tones. Like lightning, the great beasts wheeled upon her, and I looked to see her torn to pieces before I could reach her side, but instead the creature slunk to her feet like puppies that expect a merited whipping. Again she spoke to them, but in tones so low I could not catch the words, and then she started toward the opposite side of the chamber with the six mighty monsters trailing at heel. 
One by one, she sent them through the secret panel into the room beyond, and when the last had passed from the chamber where we stood in wide-eyed amazement, she turned and smiled at us, and then herself passed through, leaving us alone. For a moment, neither of us spoke. Then Tars Tarkas said, I heard the fighting beyond the partition through which you passed, but I did not fear for you, John Carter, until I heard the report of a revolver shot. I knew that there lived no man upon all Barsoom who could face you with naked steel and live, but the shot stripped the last vestige of hope from me, since you I knew to be without firearms. Tell me of it. I did as he bade, and then together we sought the secret panel through which I had just entered the apartment, the one at the opposite end of the room from that through which the girl had led her savage companions. To our disappointment, the panel eluded our every effort to negotiate its secret lock. We felt that once beyond it, we might look with some little hope of success for a passage to the outside world. The fact that the prisoners within were securely chained led us to believe that surely there must be an avenue of escape from the terrible creatures which inhabited this unspeakable place. Again and again, we turned from one door to another, from the baffling golden panel at one end of the chamber to its mate at the other, equally baffling. When we had about given up all hope, one of the panels turned silently toward us, and the young woman who had led away the banths stood once more beside us. Who are you? she asked. And what your mission, that you have the temerity to attempt to escape from the valley door and the death you have chosen? I have chosen no death, maiden, I replied. I am not of Barsoom, nor have I taken yet the voluntary pilgrimage upon the river Iesses. My friend here is Jeddak of all the Tharks, and though he has not yet expressed a desire to return to the living world, I am taking him with me from the living lie that hath lured him to this frightful place. I am of another world. I am John Carter, prince of the house of Tardos Mors, Jeddak of Helium. Perchance some faint rumour of me may have leaked within the confines of your hellish abode. She smiled. Yes, she replied. Nought that passes in the world we have left is unknown here. I have heard of you many years ago. The Therns have oft times wondered whither you had flown, since you had neither taken the pilgrimage nor could be found upon the face of Barsoom. Tell me, I said, and who be you, and why a prisoner, yet with power over the ferocious beasts of the place, that denotes familiarity and authority far beyond that which might be expected of a prisoner or a slave. Slave, I am, she answered, for fifteen years a slave in this terrible place, and now that they have tired of me and become fearful of the power which my knowledge of their ways has given me, I am but recently condemned to die the death. She shuddered. What death? I asked. The holy therns eat human flesh, she answered me, but only that which has died beneath the sucking lips of a plant man, flesh from which the defiling blood of life has been drawn. And to this cruel end I have been condemned. It was to be within a few hours had your advent not caused an interruption of their plans. Was it then holy therns who felt the weight of John Carter's hand? I asked. Oh no, those whom you laid low are lesser therns, but of the same cruel and hateful race. The holy therns abide upon the outer slopes of these grim hills, facing the broad world from which they harvest their victims and their spoils. Labyrinthine passages connect these caves with the luxurious palaces of the holy therns, and through them pass upon their many duties the lesser therns, and hordes of slaves and prisoners and fierce beasts, the grim inhabitants of this sunless world. There be within this vast network of winding passages and countless chambers men, women, and beasts who, born within its dim and gruesome underworld, have never seen the light of day, nor ever shall. They are kept to do the bidding of the race of therns, to furnish at once their sport and their sustenance. Now and again some hapless pilgrim, drifting out upon the silent sea from the cold Iesses, escapes the plant men and the great white apes that guard the Temple of Issus, and falls into the remorseless clutches of the therns, or, as was my misfortune, 
is coveted by the Holy Thern, who chances to be upon watch in the balcony above the river where it issues from the bowels of the mountains through the cliffs of gold to empty into the lost sea of Chorus. All who reach the valley door are, by custom, the rightful prey of the plant men and the apes, while their arms and ornaments become the portion of the therns. But if one escapes the terrible denizens of the valley, for even a few hours, the therns may claim such a one as their own. And again, the holy thern on watch, should he see a victim he covets, often tramples upon the rights of the unreasoning brutes of the valley and takes his prize by foul means if he cannot gain it by fair. It is said that occasionally some deluded victim of Barsoomian superstition will so far escape the clutches of the countless enemies that beset his path from the moment that he emerges from the subterranean passage through which the IS flows for a thousand miles before it enters the valley door as to reach the very walls of the Temple of Issus. But what fate awaits one there, not even the holy therns may guess. For who has passed within those gilded walls never has returned to unfold the mysteries they have held since the beginning of time. The Temple of Issus is to the therns what the valley door is imagined by the peoples of the outer world to be to them. It is the ultimate haven of peace, refuge and happiness to which they pass after this life, and wherein an eternity of eternities is spent amidst the delights of the flesh which appeal most strongly to this race of mental giants and moral pygmies. The Temple of Issus is, I take it, a heaven within a heaven, I said. Let us hope that there it will be meted to the therns as they have meted it here unto others. Who knows, the girl murmured. The therns, I judge from what you have said, are no less mortal than we, and yet have I always heard them spoken of with the utmost awe and reverence by the people of Barsoom as one might speak of the gods themselves. The therns are mortal, she replied. They die from the same causes as you or I might. Those who do not live their allotted span of life, one thousand years, when by the authority of custom they may take their way in happiness through the long tunnel that leads to Issus. Those who die before are supposed to spend the balance of their allotted time in the image of a plant man, and it is for this reason that the plant men are held sacred by the therns, since they believe that each of these hideous creatures was formerly a thern. And should a plant man die? I asked. Should he die before the expiration of the thousand years from the birth of the thern, whose immortality abides within him, then the soul passes into a great white ape. But should the ape die short of the exact hour that terminates the thousand years, the soul is forever lost and passes for all eternity into the carcass of the slimy and fearsome Scyllians, whose wriggling thousands seethe the silent sea beneath the hurtling moons when the sun has gone and strange shapes walk through the valley door. We sent several holy therns to the Scyllians today then, said Tars Tarkas, laughing. And so will your death be the more terrible when it comes, said the maiden, and come it will. You cannot escape. One has escaped centuries ago, I reminded her, and what has been done may be done again. It is useless even to try, she answered hopelessly. But try we shall, I cried, and you shall go with us if you wish. To be put to death by mine own people and render my memory a disgrace to my family and my nation. A prince of the house of Tardos Moor should know better than to suggest such a thing. Tars Tarkas listened in silence, but I could feel his eyes riveted upon me, and I knew that he awaited my answer, as one might listen to the reading of his sentence by the foreman of a jury. What I advised the girl to do would seal our fate as well, since if I bowed to the inevitable decree of age-old superstition, we must all remain and meet our fate in some horrible form within this awful abode of horror and cruelty. We have the right to escape if we can, I answered. Our own moral senses will not be offended if we succeed, for we know that the fabled life of love and peace in the blessed Valley of Dor is a rank and wicked deception. We know that the valley is not sacred. We know that the holy therns are not holy, that they are a race of cruel and heartless mortals, knowing no more of the real life to come than we do. 
Not only is it our right to bend every effort to escape, it is a solemn duty from which we should not shrink, even though we know that we should be reviled and tortured by our own peoples when we return to them. Only thus may we carry the truth to those without, and though the likelihood of our narrative being given credence is, I grant you, remote, so wedded are mortals to their stupid infatuation for impossible superstitions, we should be craven cowards indeed were we to shirk the plain duty which confronts us. Again, there is a chance that with the weight of the testimony of several of us, the truth of our statements may be accepted, and at least a compromise effected, which will result in the dispatching of an expedition of investigation to this hideous mockery of heaven. Both the girl and the green warrior stood silent in thought for some moments. The former it was who eventually broke the silence. Never had I considered the matter in that light before, she said. Indeed, would I give my life a thousand times if I could, but save a single soul from the awful life that I have led in this cruel place. Yes, you are right, and I will go with you as far as we can go, but I doubt that we ever shall escape. I turned an inquiring glance toward the Thark. To the gates of Issus, or to the bottom of Chorus, spoke the green warrior. To the snows to the north, or to the snows to the south, Tars Tarkas follows where John Carter leads. I have spoken. Come then, I cried. We must make the start, for we could not be further from escape than we now are in the heart of this mountain, and within the four walls of this chamber of death. Come then said the girl, but do not flatter yourself that you can find no worse place than this within the territory of the therns. So saying, she swung the secret panel that separated us from the apartment in which I had found her, and we stepped through once more into the presence of the other prisoners. There were in all ten red Martians, men and women, and when we had briefly explained our plan, they decided to join forces with us though it was evident that it was with some considerable misgivings that they thus tempted fate by opposing an ancient superstition, even though each knew through cruel experience the fallacy of its entire fabric. Thuvia, the girl whom I had first freed, soon had the others at liberty. Tars, Tarkas, and I stripped the bodies of the two therns of their weapons, which included swords, daggers, and two revolvers of the curious and deadly type manufactured by the Red Martians. We distributed the weapons as far as they would go among our followers, giving the firearms to two of the women, Thuvia being one so armed. With the latter as our guide, we set off rapidly but cautiously through a maze of passages, crossing great chambers hewn from the solid metal of the cliff, following winding corridors, ascending steep inclines, and now and again concealing ourselves in dark recesses at the sound of approaching footsteps. Our destination, Thuvia said, was a distant storeroom where arms and ammunition in plenty might be found. From there, she was to lead us to the summit of the cliffs, from where it would require both wondrous wit and mighty fighting to win our way through the very heart of the stronghold of the Holy Therns to the world without. And even then, O oh Prince, she cried. The arm of the Holy Thern is long. It reaches to every nation of Barsoom. His secret temples are hidden in the heart of every community. Wherever we go, should we escape, we shall find that word of our coming has preceded us, and death awaits us before we may pollute the air with our blasphemies. We had proceeded for possibly an hour without serious interruption, and Thuvia had just whispered to me that we were approaching our first destination, when on entering a great chamber we came upon a man, evidently a thern. He wore, in addition to his leathern trappings and jeweled ornaments, a great circlet of gold about his brow, in the exact centre of which was set an immense stone, the exact counterpart of that which I had seen upon the breast of the little old man at the atmosphere plant nearly twenty years before. It is the one priceless jewel of Barsu. Only two are known to exist, and these were worn as the insignia of their rank and position by the two old men in whose charge was placed the operation of the great engines which pump the artificial atmosphere to all parts of Mars from the huge atmosphere plant, 
the secret to whose mighty portals placed in my possession the ability to save from immediate extinction the life of a whole world. The stone worn by the thern who confronted us was of about the same size as that which I had seen before, an inch in diameter, I should say. It scintillated nine different and distinct rays, the seven primary colors of our earthly prism and the two rays which are unknown upon Earth, but whose wondrous beauty is indescribable. As the thern saw us, his eyes narrowed to two nasty slits. Stop! he cried. What means this, Thuvia? For answer, the girl raised her revolver and fired point-blank at him. Without a sound, he sank to the earth, dead. Beast! she hissed. After all these years, I'm at last revenged. Then, as she turned toward me, evidently with a word of explanation on her lips, her eyes suddenly widened as they rested upon me, and with a little exclamation, she started toward me. Oh, prince, she cried, fate is indeed kind to us. The way is still difficult, but through this vile thing upon the floor, we may yet win to the outer world. Notice thou not the remarkable resemblance between this holy thern and thyself. The man was indeed of my precise stature, nor were his eyes and features unlike mine, but his hair was a mass of flowing yellow locks, like those of the two I had killed, while mine is black and close-cropped. What of the resemblance? I asked the girl Thuvia. Do you wish me with my black, short hair to pose as a yellow-haired priest of this infernal cult? She smiled, and for answer approached the body of the man she had slain, and kneeling beside it, removed the circlet of gold from the forehead, and then to my utter amazement, lifted the entire scalp bodily from the corpse's head. Rising, she advanced to my side, and placing the yellow wig over my black hair, crowned me with the golden circlet set with the magnificent gem. Now, don his harness, prince, she said, and you may pass where you will in the realms of the therns, for Sata Throg was a holy thern of the tenth cycle, and mighty among his kind. As I stooped to the dead man to do her bidding, I noted that not a hair grew upon his head, which was quite as bald as an egg. They are all thus from birth, explained Thuvia, noting my surprise. The race from which they sprang were crowned with a luxuriant growth of golden hair, but for many ages the present race has been entirely bald. The wig, however, has come to be a part of their apparel, and so important a part do they consider it that it is cause for the deepest disgrace were a thern to appear in public without it. In another moment I stood garbed in the habiliments of a holy thern. At Thuvia's suggestion, two of the released prisoners bore the body of the dead thern upon their shoulders with us as we continued our journey toward the storeroom, which we reached without further mishap. Here, the keys which Thuvia bore from the dead thern of the prison vault were the means of giving us immediate entrance to the chamber, and very quickly we were thoroughly outfitted with arms and ammunition. By this time I was so thoroughly fagged out that I could go no further, so I threw myself upon the floor, bidding Tars Tarkas to do likewise, and cautioning two of the released prisoners to keep careful watch. In an instant I was asleep. Chapter 5 Corridors of Peril How long I slept upon the floor of the storeroom I do not know, but it must have been many hours. I was awakened with a start by cries of alarm, and scarce were my eyes opened, nor had I yet sufficiently collected my wits to quite realize where I was when a fusillade of shots rang out, reverberating through the subterranean corridors in a series of deafening echoes. In an instant I was upon my feet. A dozen lesser therns confronted us from a large doorway at the opposite end of the storeroom from which we had entered. About me lay the bodies of my companions with the exception of Thuvia and Tars Tarkas, who, like myself, had been asleep upon the floor and thus escaped the first raking fire. As I gained my feet, the therns lowered their wicked rifles, their faces distorted in mingled chagrin, consternation and alarm. Instantly, I rose to the occasion. What means this? I cried in tones of fierce anger. 
Is Satyr Throg to be murdered by his own vassals? Have mercy, O master of the tenth cycle, cried one of the fellows, while the others edged toward the doorway as though to attempt a surreptitious escape from the presence of the Mighty One. Ask them their mission here, whispered Thuvia at my elbow. What do you hear, fellows? I cried. Two from the outer world are at large within the dominions of the Therns. We sought them at the command of the Father of Therns. One was white with black hair, the other a huge green warrior. And here the fellow cast a suspicious glance toward Tars Tarkas. Here, then, is one of them, spoke Thuvia, indicating the Thark. And if you will look upon this dead man by the door, perhaps you will recognize the other. It was left for Satyr Throg and his poor slaves to accomplish what the lesser therns of the guard were unable to do. We have killed one and captured the other, for this had Satyr Throg given us our liberty. And now, in your stupidity, have you come and killed all but myself, and like to have killed the mighty Satyr Throg himself? The men looked very sheepish and very scared. Had they not better throw these bodies to the plant men, and then return to their quarters, O mighty one? asked Thuvia of me. Yes, do as Thuvia bids you, I said. As the men picked up the bodies, I noticed that the one who stooped to gather up the late Satyr Throg started as his closer scrutiny fell upon the upturned face, and then the fellow stole a furtive, sneaking glance in my direction from the corner of his eye. That he suspicioned something of the truth I could have sworn, but that it was only a suspicion which he did not dare voice was evidenced by his silence. Again, as he bore the body from the room, he shot a quick but searching glance toward me, and then his eyes fell once more upon the bald and shiny dome of the dead man in his arms. The last fleeting glimpse that I obtained of his profile as he passed from my sight without the chamber revealed a cunning smile of triumph upon his lips. Only Tars Tarkas, Thuvia, and I were left. The fatal marksmanship of the Therns had snatched from our companions whatever slender chance they had of gaining the perilous freedom of the world without. So soon as the last of the gruesome procession had disappeared, the girl urged us to take up our flight once more. She, too, had noted the questioning attitude of the Thern who had borne Satyr Throg away. It bodes no good for us, O oh Prince, she said. For even though this fellow dared not chance accusing you in error, there be those above with power sufficient to demand a closer scrutiny, and that Prince would indeed prove fatal. I shrugged my shoulders. It seemed that in any event the outcome of our plight must end in death. I was refreshed from my sleep, but still weak from loss of blood. My wounds were painful. No medicinal aid seemed possible. How I longed for the almost miraculous healing power of the strange salves and lotions of the green Martian women. In an hour, they would have had me as new. I was discouraged. Never had a feeling of such utter hopelessness come over me in the face of danger. Then the long, flowing yellow locks of the Holy Thern, caught by some vagrant draught, blew about my face. Might they not still open the way of freedom? If we acted in time, might we not even yet escape before the general alarm was sounded? We could at least try. What will the fellow do first, Thuvia? I asked. How long will it be before they may return for us? He will go directly to the father of Therns, old Matai Shang. He may have to wait for an audience, but since he is very high among the lesser therns, in fact as a Thorian among them, it will not be long that Matai Shang will keep him waiting. Then if the father of therns puts credence in his story, another hour will see the galleries and chambers, the courts and gardens, filled with searchers. What we do, then must be done within an hour. What is the best way, Thuvia, the shortest way out of this celestial Hades? Straight to the top of the cliffs, Prince, she replied, and then through the gardens to the inner courts. From there, our way will lie within the temples of the therns and across them to the outer court. Then the ramparts. Oh, Prince, it is hopeless. Ten thousand warriors could not hew a way to liberty from out this awful place. Since the beginning of time, little by little, stone by stone, 
have the Therns been ever adding to the defences of their stronghold. A continuous line of impregnable fortifications circles the outer slopes of the mountains of Ots. Within the temples that lie behind the ramparts, a million fighting men are ever ready. The courts and gardens are filled with slaves, with women and with children. None could go a stone's throw without detection. If there is no other way, Thuvia, why dwell upon the difficulties of this? We must face them. Can we not better make the attempt after dark? asked Tars Tarkas. There would seem to be no chance by day. There would be a little better chance by night, but even then the ramparts are well guarded, possibly better than by day. There are fewer abroad in the courts and gardens, though, said Thuvia. What is the hour? I asked. It was midnight when you released me from my chains, said Thuvia. Two hours later we reached the storeroom. There you slept for fourteen hours. It must now be nearly sundown again. Come, we will go to some nearby window in the cliff and make sure. So saying, she led the way through winding corridors, until at a sudden turn we came upon an opening which overlooked the valley door. At our right, the sun was setting, a huge red orb below the western range of Ott. A little below us stood the Holy Thern on watch upon his balcony. His scarlet robe of office was pulled tightly about him in anticipation of the cold that comes so suddenly with darkness as the sun sets. So rare is the atmosphere of Mars that it absorbs very little heat from the sun. During the daylight hours it is always extremely hot, at night it is intensely cold, nor does the thin atmosphere refract the sun's rays or diffuse its light as upon Earth. There is no twilight on Mars. When the great orb of day disappears beneath the horizon, the effect is precisely as that of the extinguishing of a single lamp within a chamber. From brilliant light, you are plunged without warning into utter darkness. Then the moons come, the mysterious magic moons of Mars, hurtling like monster meteors low across the face of the planet. The declining sun lighted brilliantly the eastern banks of Chorus, the crimson sward, the gorgeous forest. Beneath the trees we saw feeding many herds of plantmen. The adults stood aloft upon their toes and their mighty tails, their talons pruning every available leaf and twig. It was then that I understood the careful trimming of the trees which had led me to form the mistaken idea when first I opened my eyes upon the grove that it was the playground of a civilized people. As we watched, our eyes wandered to the rolling ISs which issued from the base of the cliffs beneath us. Presently, there emerged from the mountain a canoe laden with lost souls from the outer world. There were a dozen of them. All were of the highly civilized and cultured race of red men who are dominant on Mars. The eyes of the herald upon the balcony beneath us fell upon the doomed party as soon as did ours. He raised his head and leaning far out over the low rail that rimmed his dizzy perch, voiced the shrill weird wail that called the demons of this hellish place to the attack. For an instant, the brutes stood with stiffly erected ears, then they poured from the grove toward the river's bank, covering the distance with great ungainly leaps. The party had landed and was standing on the sward as the awful horde came in sight. There was a brief and futile effort of defense, then silence as the huge, repulsive shapes covered the bodies of their victims and scores of sucking mouths fastened themselves to the flesh of their prey. I turned away in disgust, their part is soon over, said Thuvia. The great white apes get the flesh when the plant men have drained the arteries. Look, they are coming now. As I turned my eyes in the direction the girl indicated, I saw a dozen of the great white monsters running across the valley toward the riverbank. Then the sun went down, and darkness that could almost be felt engulfed us. Thuvia lost no time in leading us toward the corridor, which winds back and forth up through the cliffs toward the surface, thousands of feet above the level on which we had been. Twice great banths, wandering loose through the galleries, blocked our progress, but in each instance Thuvia spoke a low word of command, and the snarling beasts slunk sullenly away. If you can dissolve all our obstacles as easily as you master these fierce brutes, I can see no difficulties in our way. I said to the girl, smiling. How do you do it? 
She laughed and then shuddered. I do not quite know, she said. When first I came here, I angered Satter Throg because I repulsed him. He ordered me to be thrown into one of the great pits in the inner gardens. It was filled with banths. In my own country, I had been accustomed to command. Something in my voice, I do not know what, cowed the beasts as they sprang to attack me. Instead of tearing me to pieces, as Satyr Throg had desired, they fawned at my feet. So greatly were Satyr Throg and his friends amused by the sight that they kept me to train and handle the terrible creatures. I know them all by name. There are many of them wandering through these lower regions. They are the scavengers. Many prisoners die here in their chains. The Banths solve the problem of sanitation, at least in this respect. In the gardens and temples above, they are kept in pits. The Therns fear them. It is because of the Banths that they seldom venture below ground, except as their duties call them. An idea occurred to me, suggested by what Thuvia had just said. Why not take a number of Banths and set them loose before us above ground? I asked. Thuvia laughed. It would distract attention from us, I am sure, she said. She commenced calling in a low, sing-song voice that was half purr. She continued this as we wound our tedious way through the maze of subterranean passages and chambers. Presently, soft, padded feet sounded close behind us, and as I turned, I saw a pair of great green eyes shining in the dark shadows at our rear. From a diverging tunnel, a sinuous, tawny form crept stealthily toward us. Low growls and angry snarls assailed our ears on every side as we hastened on, and one by one the ferocious creatures answered the call of their mistress. She spoke a word to each as it joined us. Like well-schooled terriers, they paced the corridors with us, but I could not help but note the lathering jowls, nor the hungry expressions with which they eyed Tars Tarkas and myself. Soon we were entirely surrounded by some fifty of the brutes. Two walked close on either side of Thuvia as guards might walk. The sleek sides of others now and then touched my own naked limbs. It was a strange experience, the almost noiseless passage of naked human feet and padded paws, the golden walls splashed with precious stones. The dim light cast by the tiny radium bulbs set at considerable distances along the roof. The huge, maned beasts of prey, crowding with low growls about us. The mighty green warrior towering high above us all. Myself crowned with the priceless diadem of a holy thern, and leading the procession, the beautiful girl, Thuvia. I shall not soon forget it. Presently, we approached a great chamber more brightly lighted than the corridors. Thuvia halted us. Quietly, she stole toward the entrance and glanced within. Then she motioned us to follow her. The room was filled with specimens of the strange beings that inhabit this underworld, a heterogeneous collection of hybrids, the offspring of the prisoners from the outside world, red and green Martians and the white race of therns. Constant confinement below ground had wrought odd freaks upon their skins. They more resemble corpses than living beings. Many are deformed, others maimed, while the majority, Thuvia explained, are sightless. As they lay sprawled about the floor, sometimes overlapping one another, again in heaps of several bodies, they suggested instantly to me the grotesque illustrations that I had seen in copies of Dante's Inferno, and what more fitting comparison. Was this not indeed a veritable hell, peopled by lost souls, dead and damned beyond all hope? Picking our way carefully, we threaded a winding path across the chamber, the great banths sniffing hungrily at the tempting prey spread before them in such tantalizing and defenseless profusion. Several times we passed the entrances to other chambers similarly peopled, and twice again we were compelled to cross directly through them. In others were chained prisoners and beasts. Why is it that we see no therns? I asked of Thuvia. They seldom traverse the underworld at night, for then it is that the great banths prowl the dim corridors seeking their prey. The therns fear the awful denizens of this cruel and hopeless world that they have fostered and allowed to grow beneath their feet. 
The prisoners even sometimes turn upon them and rend them. The thern can never tell from what dark shadow an assassin may spring upon his back. By day, it is different. Then the corridors and chambers are filled with guards passing to and fro. Slaves from the temples above come by hundreds to the granaries and storerooms. All is life then. You did not see it, because I led you not in the beaten tracks, but through roundabout passages seldom used. Yet it is possible that we may meet a thern even yet. They do occasionally find it necessary to come here after the sun has set. Because of this, I have moved with such great caution. But we reached the upper galleries without detection, and presently Thuvia halted us at the foot of a short, steep ascent. Above us, she said, is a doorway which opens onto the inner gardens. I have brought you thus far. From here on, for four miles to the outer ramparts, our way will be beset by countless dangers. Guards patrol the courts, the temples, the gardens. Every inch of the ramparts themselves is beneath the eye of a sentry. I could not understand the necessity for such an enormous force of armed men about a spot so surrounded by mystery and superstition that not a soul upon Barsoom would have dared to approach it even had they known its exact location. I questioned Thuvia, asking her what enemies the Therns could fear in their impregnable fortress. We had reached the doorway now, and Thuvia was opening it. They fear the black pirates of Barsoom, O oh Prince, she said, from whom may our first ancestors preserve us. The door swung open. The smell of growing things greeted my nostrils. The cool night air blew against my cheek. The great banths sniffed the unfamiliar odours, and then with a rush they broke past us with low growls, swarming across the gardens beneath the lurid light of the nearer moon. Suddenly, a great cry arose from the roofs of the temples, a cry of alarm and warning that, taken up from point to point, ran off to the east and to the west, from temple, court, and rampart, until it sounded as a dim echo in the distance. The great Thark's long sword leaped from its scabbard. Thuvia shrank, shuddering to my side. Chapter 6 The Black Pirates of Barsoom What is it? I asked of the girl. For answer, she pointed to the sky. I looked, and there, above us, I saw shadowy bodies flitting hither and thither high over temple, court, and garden. Almost immediately, flashes of light broke from these strange objects. There was a roar of musketry, and then answering flashes and roars from temple and rampart. The black pirates of Barsoom, O Prince, said Thuvia. In great circles, the aircraft of the marauders swept lower and lower toward the defending forces of the therns. Volley after volley, they vomited upon the temple guards. Volley on volley crashed through the thin air toward the fleeting and elusive flyers. As the pirates swooped closer toward the ground, Thern's soldiery poured from the temples into the gardens and courts. The sight of them in the open brought a score of flyers darting toward us from all directions. The Therns fired upon them through shields affixed to their rifles, but on, steadily on, came the grim, black craft. They were small flyers for the most part, built for two to three men. A few larger ones there were, but these kept high aloft, dropping bombs upon the temples from their keel batteries. At length, with a concerted rush, evidently in response to a signal of command, the pirates in our immediate vicinity dashed recklessly to the ground in the very midst of the thern soldiery. Scarcely waiting for their craft to touch, the creatures manning them leaped among the therns with the fury of demons. Such fighting! Never had I witnessed its like before. I had thought the green Martians the most ferocious warriors in the universe, but the awful abandon with which the black pirates threw themselves upon their foes transcended everything I ever before had seen. Beneath the brilliant light of Mars' two glorious moons, the whole scene presented itself in vivid distinctness. The golden-haired, white-skinned therns battling with desperate courage in hand-to-hand -hand conflict with their ebony-skinned foemen. Here, a little knot of struggling warriors trampled a bed of gorgeous pimalia. There, the curved sword of a black man found the heart of a thern, 
and left its dead foeman at the foot of a wondrous statue carved from a living ruby. Yonder, a dozen therns pressed a single pirate back upon a bench of emerald, upon whose iridescent surface a strangely beautiful Barsoomian design was traced out in inlaid diamonds. A little to one side stood Thuvia, the Thark, and I. The tide of battle had not reached us, but the fighters from time to time swung close enough that we might distinctly note them. The black pirates interested me immensely. I had heard vague rumours, little more than legends they were, during my former life on Mars, but never had I seen them, nor talked with one who had. They were popularly supposed to inhabit the Lesser Moon, from which they descended upon Barsoom at long intervals. Where they visited, they wrought the most horrible atrocities, and when they left, carried away with them firearms and ammunition, and young girls as prisoners. These latter, the rumour had it, they sacrificed to some terrible god in an orgy which ended in the eating of their victims. I had an excellent opportunity to examine them, as the strife occasionally brought now one and now another close to where I stood. They were large men, possibly six feet, and over in height. Their features were clear-cut and handsome in the extreme. Their eyes were well set and large, though a slight narrowness lent them a crafty appearance. The iris, as well as I could determine by moonlight, was of extreme blackness, while the eyeball itself was quite white and clear. The physical structure of their bodies seemed identical with those of the therns, the red men, and my own. Only in the colour of their skin did they differ materially from us, that is, of the appearance of polished ebony, and odd as it may seem for a southerner to say it, adds to rather than detracts from their marvellous beauty. But if their bodies are divine, their hearts, apparently, are quite the reverse. Never did I witness such a malign lust for blood as these demons of the outer air evinced in their mad battle with the therns. All about us in the garden lay their sinister craft, which the therns, for some reason, then unaccountable to me, made no effort to injure. Now and again a black warrior would rush from a nearby temple bearing a young woman in his arms. Straight for his flyer he would leap, while those of his comrades who fought nearby would rush to cover his escape. The therns on their side would hasten to rescue the girl, and in an instant the two would be swallowed in the vortex of a maelstrom of yelling devils, hacking and hewing at one another like fiends incarnate. But always, it seemed, were the black pirates of Barsoom victorious, and the girl, brought miraculously unharmed through the conflict, borne away into the outer darkness upon the deck of a swift flyer. Fighting similar to that which surrounded us could be heard in both directions as far as sound carried, and Thuvia told me that the attacks of the black pirates were usually made simultaneously along the entire ribbon-like domain of the therns, which circles the valley door on the outer slopes of the mountains of Otz. As the fighting receded from our position for a moment, Thuvia turned toward me with a question. Do you understand now, O Prince, she said, why a million warriors guard the domains of the Holy Therns by day and by night? The scene you are witnessing now is but a repetition of what I have seen enacted a score of times during the fifteen years I have been a prisoner here. From time immemorial, the black pirates of Barsoom have preyed upon the holy therns. Yet they never carry their expeditions to a point, as one might readily believe it was in their power to do, where the extermination of the race of therns is threatened. It is as though they but utilize the race as playthings, with which they satisfy their ferocious lust for fighting, and from whom they collect toll in arms and ammunition and in prisoners. Why don't they jump in and destroy these flyers? I asked. That would soon put a stop to the attacks, or at least the blacks would scarce be so bold. Why, see how perfectly unguarded they leave their craft, as though they were lying safe in their own hangars at home. The therns do not dare. They tried it once, ages ago, but the next night, and for a whole moon thereafter, a thousand great black battleships circled the mountains of Otz, pouring tons of projectiles upon the temples, the gardens, and the courts, until every thern who was not killed was driven for safety into the subterranean galleries. 
The therns know that they live at all only by the sufferance of the black men. They were near to extermination at once, and they will not venture risking it again. As she ceased talking, a new element was instilled into the conflict. It came from a source equally unlooked for by either Thern or Pirate. The great banths which we had liberated in the garden had evidently been awed at first by the sound of the battle, the yelling of the warriors, and the loud report of rifle and bomb. But now they must have become angered by the continuous noise and excited by the smell of new blood, for all of a sudden a great form shot from a clump of low shrubbery into the midst of a struggling mass of humanity. A horrid scream of bestial rage broke from the banth as he felt warm flesh beneath his powerful talons. As though his cry was but a signal to the others, the entire great pack hurled themselves among the fighters. Panic reigned in an instant. Thern and Blackman turned alike against the common enemy, for the Banths showed no partiality toward either. The awful beasts bore down a hundred men by the mere weight of their great bodies as they hurled themselves into the thick of the fight. Leaping and clawing, they mowed down the warriors with their powerful paws, turning for an instant to rend their victims with frightful fangs. The scene was fascinating in its terribleness, but suddenly it came to me that we were wasting valuable time watching this conflict, which in itself might prove a means of our escape. The Therns were so engaged with their terrible assailants that now, if ever, escape should be comparatively easy. I turned to search for an opening through the contending hordes. If we could but reach the ramparts, we might find that the pirates somewhere had thinned the guarding forces and left a way open to us to the world without. As my eyes wandered about the garden, the sight of the hundreds of aircraft lying unguarded around us suggested the simplest avenue to freedom. Why it had not occurred to me before, I was thoroughly familiar with the mechanism of every known make of flyer on Barsoom. For nine years I had sailed and fought with the navy of Helium. I had raced through space on the tiny one-man air scout, and I had commanded the greatest battleship that ever had floated in the thin air of dying Mars. To think with me is to act. Grasping Thuvia by the arm, I whispered to Tars Tarkas to follow me. Quickly we glided toward a small flyer which lay furthest from the battling warriors. Another instant found us huddled on the tiny deck. My hand was on the starting lever. I pressed my thumb upon the button which controls the ray of repulsion, that splendid discovery of the Martians which permits them to navigate the thin atmosphere of their planet in huge ships that dwarf the dreadnoughts of our earthly navies into pitiful insignificance. The craft swayed slightly, but she did not move. Then a new cry of warning broke upon our ears. Turning, I saw a dozen black pirates dashing toward us from the melee. We had been discovered. With shrieks of rage, the demons sprang for us. With frenzied insistence, I continued to press the little button which should have sent us racing out into space, but still the vessel refused to budge. Then it came to me, the reason that she would not rise. We had stumbled upon a two-man flyer. Its ray tanks were charged only with sufficient repulsive energy to lift two ordinary men. The Thark's great weight was anchoring us to our doom. The blacks were nearly upon us. There was not an instant to be lost in hesitation or doubt. I pressed the button far in and locked it. Then I set the lever at high speed, and as the blacks came yelling upon us, I slipped from the craft's deck, and with drawn long sword met the attack. At the same moment, a girl's shriek rang out behind me, and an instant later, as the blacks fell upon me, I heard far above my head and faintly in Thuvia's voice, My prince, oh my prince, I would rather remain and die with... But the rest was lost in the noise of my assailants. I knew though that my ruse had worked, and that temporarily at least Thuvia and Tars Tarkas were safe, and the means of escape was theirs. For a moment it seemed that I could not withstand the weight of numbers that confronted me, but again, as on so many other occasions when I had been called upon to face fearful odds upon this planet of warriors and fierce beasts, 
I found that my earthly strength so far transcended that of my opponents that the odds were not so greatly against me as they appeared. My seething blade wove a net of death about me. For an instant, the blacks pressed close to reach me with their shorter swords, but presently they gave back, and the esteem in which they suddenly had learned to hold my sword arm was writ large upon each countenance. I knew, though, that it was but a question of minutes before their greater numbers would wear me down or get around my guard. I must go down eventually to certain death before them. I shuddered at the thought of it, dying thus in this terrible place where no word of my end ever could reach my Deja Thoris, dying at the hands of nameless black men in the gardens of the cruel therns. Then my old-time spirit reasserted itself. The fighting blood of my Virginian sires coursed hot through my veins. The fierce blood lust and the joy of battle surged over me. The fighting smile that has brought consternation to a thousand foemen touched my lips. I put the thought of death out of my mind and fell upon my antagonists with fury that those who escaped will remember to their dying day that others would press to the support of those who faced me I knew, so even as I fought, I kept my wits at work, searching for an avenue of escape. It came from an unexpected quarter out of the black night behind me. I had just disarmed a huge fellow who had given me a desperate struggle, and for a moment the blacks stood back for a breathing spell. They eyed me with malignant fury, yet withal there was a touch of respect in their demeanour. Thern, said one, you fight like a data, but for your detestable yellow hair and your white skin, you would be an honour to the firstborn of Barsoom. I am no Thern, I said, and was about to explain that I was from another world, thinking that by patching a truce with these fellows and fighting with them against the Therns, I might enlist their aid in regaining my liberty. But just at that moment, a heavy object smote me a resounding whack between my shoulders that nearly felled me to the ground. As I turned to meet this new enemy, an object passed over my shoulder, striking one of my assailants squarely in the face and knocking him senseless to the sward. At the same instant, I saw that the thing that had struck us was the trailing anchor of a rather fair-sized air vessel, possibly a ten-man cruiser. The ship was floating slowly above us, not more than fifty feet over our heads. Instantly, the one chance for escape that it offered presented itself to me. The vessel was slowly rising, and now the anchor was beyond the blacks who faced me and several feet above their heads. With a bound that left them gaping in wide-eyed astonishment, I sprang completely over them. A second leap carried me just high enough to grasp the now rapidly receding anchor. But I was successful and there I hung by one hand, dragging through the branches of the higher vegetation of the gardens, while my late foeman shrieked and howled beneath me. Presently the vessel veered toward the west, and then swung gracefully to the south. In another instant I was carried beyond the crest of the Golden Cliffs, out over the valley door, where, six thousand feet below me, the lost sea of Chorus lay shimmering in the moonlight. Carefully, I climbed to a sitting posture across the anchor's arms. I wondered if by chance the vessel might be deserted. I hoped so, or possibly it might belong to a friendly people and have wandered by accident almost within the clutches of the pirates and the therns. The fact that it was retreating from the scene of battle lent colour to this hypothesis. But I decided to know positively, and at once, so with the greatest caution, I commenced to climb slowly up the anchor chain toward the deck above me. One hand had just reached for the vessel's rail and found it when a fierce black face was thrust over the side and eyes filled with triumphant hate looked into mine. Chapter 7 A Fair Goddess For an instant, the black pirate and I remained motionless, glaring into each other's eyes. Then a grim smile curled the handsome lips above me as an ebony hand came slowly in sight from above the edge of the deck and the cold, hollow eye of a revolver sought the centre of my forehead. Simultaneously, my free hand shot out for the black throat just within reach and the ebony finger tightened on the trigger. The pirates hissing, Die, cursed Thern, 
was half choked in his windpipe by my clutching fingers. The hammer fell with a futile click upon an empty chamber. Before he could fire again, I had pulled him so far over the edge of the deck that he was forced to drop his firearm and clutch the rail with both hands. My grasp upon his throat effectually prevented any outcry, and so we struggled in grim silence, he to tear away from my hold, I to drag him over to his death. His face was taking on a livid hue, his eyes were bulging from their sockets. It was evident to him that he soon must die unless he tore loose from the steel fingers that were choking the life from him. With a final effort, he threw himself further back upon the deck, at the same instant releasing his hold upon the rail to tear frantically with both hands at my fingers in an effort to drag them from his throat. That little second was all that I awaited. With one mighty downward surge, I swept him clear of the deck. His falling body came near to tearing me from the frail hold that my single free hand had upon the anchor chain and plunging me with him to the waters of the sea below. I did not relinquish my grasp upon him, however, for I knew that a single shriek from those lips as he hurtled to his death in the silent waters of the sea would bring his comrades from above to avenge him. Instead, I held grimly to him, choking, ever choking, while his frantic struggles dragged me lower and lower toward the end of the chain. Gradually his contortions became spasmodic, lessening by degrees until they ceased entirely. Then I released my hold upon him, and in an instant he was swallowed by the black shadows far below. Again I climbed to the ship's rail. This time I succeeded in raising my eyes to the level of the deck where I could take a careful survey of the conditions immediately confronting me. The nearer moon had passed below the horizon, but the clear effulgence of the further satellite bathed the deck of the cruiser, bringing into sharp relief the bodies of six or eight black men sprawled about in sleep. Huddled close to the base of a rapid fire gun was a young white girl, securely bound. Her eyes were widespread in an expression of horrified anticipation and fixed directly upon me as I came in sight above the edge of the deck. Unutterable relief instantly filled them as if they fell upon the mystic jewel which sparkled in the center of my stolen headpiece. She did not speak. Instead, her eyes warned me to beware the sleeping figures that surrounded her. Noiselessly, I gained the deck. The girl nodded to me to approach her. As I bent low, she whispered to me to release her. I can aid you, she said, and you will need all the aid available when they awaken. Some of them will awake in chorus, I replied, smiling. She caught the meaning of my words, and the cruelty of her answering smile horrified me. One is not astonished by cruelty in a hideous face, but when it touches the features of a goddess whose fine chiseled lineaments might more fittingly portray love and beauty. The contrast is appalling. Quickly, I released her. Give me a revolver, she whispered. I can use that upon those your sword does not silence in time. I did as she bid. Then I turned toward the distasteful work that lay before me. This was no time for fine compunctions, nor for a chivalry that these cruel demons would neither appreciate nor reciprocate. Stealthily, I approached the nearest sleeper. When he awoke, he was well on his journey to the bosom of Chorus. His piercing shriek as consciousness returned to him came faintly up to us from the black depths beneath. The second awoke as I touched him, and though I succeeded in hurling him from the cruiser's deck, his wild cry of alarm brought the remaining pirates to their feet. There were five of them. As they arose, the girl's revolver spoke in sharp staccato, and one sank back to the deck again to rise no more. The others rushed madly upon me with drawn swords. The girl evidently dared not fire for fear of wounding me, but I saw her sneak stealthily and cat-like toward the flank of the attackers. Then they were on me. For a few minutes I experienced some of the hottest fighting I had ever passed through. The quarters were too small for footwork. It was stand your ground and give and take. At first I took considerably more than I gave, but presently I got beneath one fellow's guard and had the satisfaction of seeing him collapse upon the deck. The others redoubled their efforts. The crashing of their blades upon mine raised a terrific din that might have been heard for miles through the silent night. 
Sparks flew as steel smote steel, and then there was the dull and sickening sound of a shoulder bone parting beneath the keen edge of my Martian sword. Three now faced me, but the girl was working her way to a point that would soon permit her to reduce the number by one at least. Then things happened with such amazing rapidity that I can scarce comprehend even now all that took place in that brief instant. The three rushed me with the evident purpose of forcing me back the few steps that would carry my body over the rail into the void below. At the same instant, the girl fired, and my sword arm made two moves. One man dropped with a bullet in his brain. A sword flew clattering across the deck and dropped over the edge beyond as I disarmed one of my opponents, and the third went down with my blade buried to the hilt in his breast and three feet of it protruding from his back and falling wrenched the sword from my grasp. Disarmed myself, I now faced my remaining foeman, whose own sword lay somewhere thousands of feet below us, lost in the lost sea. The new conditions seemed to please my adversary, for a smile of satisfaction bared his gleaming teeth as he rushed at me bare-handed. The great muscles which rolled beneath his glossy black hide evidently assured him that here was easy prey, not worth the trouble of drawing the dagger from his harness. I let him come almost upon me, then I ducked beneath his outstretched arms at the same time sidestepping to the right. Pivoting on my left toe, I swung a terrific right to his jaw, and like a felled ox, he dropped in his tracks. A low, silvery laugh rang out behind me. You are no thern, said the sweet voice of my companion, for all your golden locks, or the harness of satyr throg. Never live there upon all Barsoom before one who could fight as you have fought this night. Who are you? I am John Carter, Prince of the House of Tardos Moors, Jeddak of Helium, I replied. And whom, I added, has the honor of serving been accorded me? She hesitated a moment before speaking. Then she asked, You are no Thern. Are you an enemy of the Therns? I have been in the territory of the Therns for a day and a half. During that entire time my life has been in constant danger. I have been harassed and persecuted. Armed men and fierce beasts have been set upon me. I had no quarrel with the Therns before, but can you wonder that I feel no great love for them now? I have spoken. She looked at me intently for several minutes before she replied. It was as though she were attempting to read my inmost soul, to judge my character and my standards of chivalry in that long-drawn, searching gaze. Apparently, the inventory satisfied her. I am Fidor, daughter of Matai Shang, Holy Hecador of the Holy Therns, Father of Therns, Master of Life and Death upon Barsoom, Brother of Issus, Prince of Life Eternal. At that moment, I noticed that the black I had dropped with my fist was commencing to show signs of returning consciousness. I sprang to his side. Stripping his harness from him, I securely bound his hands behind his back and after similarly fastening his feet, tied him to a heavy gun carriage. Why not the simpler way? asked Fidor. I do not understand. What simpler way? I replied. With a slight shrug of her lovely shoulders, she made a gesture with her hands, personating the casting of something over the craft side. I am no murderer, I said. I kill in self-defense only. She looked at me narrowly. Then she puckered those divine brows of hers and shook her head. She could not comprehend. Well, neither had my own Deja Thoris been able to understand what to her had seemed a foolish and dangerous policy toward enemies. Upon Barsoom, quarter is neither asked nor given, and each dead man means so much more of the waning resources of this dying planet to be divided amongst those who survive. But there seemed a subtle difference here between the manner in which this girl contemplated the dispatching of an enemy and the tender-hearted regret of my own princess for the stern necessity which demanded it. I think that Fidor regretted the thrill that the spectacle would have afforded her rather than the fact that my decision left another enemy alive to threaten us. The man had now regained full possession of his faculties and was regarding us intently from where he lay bound upon the deck. He was a handsome fellow, 
clean-limbed and powerful, with an intelligent face and features of such exquisite chiseling that Adonis himself might have envied him. The vessel, unguided, had been moving slowly across the valley, but now I thought it time to take the helm and direct her course. Only in a very general way could I guess the location of the valley door. That it was far south of the equator was evident from the constellations, but I was not sufficiently a Martian astronomer to come much closer than a rough guess without the splendid charts and delicate instruments with which, as an officer in the Heliumite navy, I had formerly reckoned the positions of the vessels on which I sailed that a northerly course would quickest lead me toward the more settled portions of the planet immediately decided the direction that I should steer. Beneath my hand, the cruiser swung gracefully about. Then the button which controlled the repulsive rays sent us soaring far out into space. With speed lever pulled to the last notch, we raced toward the north as we rose ever farther and farther above that terrible valley of death. As we passed at a dizzy height over the narrow domains of the therns, the flash of powder far below bore mute witness to the ferocity of the battle that still raged along that cruel frontier. No sound of conflict reached our ears, for in the rarefied atmosphere of our great altitude no sound wave could penetrate. They were dissipated in thin air far below us. It became intensely cold. Breathing was difficult. The girl, Fidor, and the black pirate kept their eyes glued upon me. At length, the girl spoke. Unconsciousness comes quickly at this altitude, she said quietly. Unless you are inviting death for us all, you had best drop, and that quickly. There was no fear in her voice. It was as one might say. You had better carry an umbrella. It is going to rain. I dropped the vessel quickly to a lower level. Nor was I a moment too soon. The girl had swooned. The black, too, was unconscious, while I, myself, retained my senses, I think, only by sheer will. The one on whom all responsibility rests is apt to endure the most. We were swinging along low above the foothills of the Ots. It was comparatively warm, and there was plenty of air for our starved lungs, so I was not surprised to see the black open his eyes, and a moment later, the girl also. It was a close call, she said. It has taught me two things, though, I replied. What? That even Fidor, daughter of the master of life and death, is mortal, I said, smiling. There is immortality only in Issus, she replied, and Issus is for the race of therns alone. Thus am I immortal. I caught a fleeting grin passing across the features of the black as he heard her words, I did not then understand why he smiled. Later I was to learn, and she too in a most horrible manner. If the other thing you have just learned, she continued, has led to as erroneous deductions as the first you are little richer in knowledge than you were before. The other, I replied, is that our dusky friend here does not hail from the nearer moon. He was like to have died at a few thousand feet above Barsoom. Had we continued the five thousand miles that lie between Thuria and the planet, he would have been but the frozen memory of a man. Fidor looked at the black in evident astonishment. If you are not of Thuria, then where? she asked. He shrugged his shoulders and turned his eyes elsewhere, but did not reply. The girl stamped her little foot in a peremptory manner. The daughter of Matai Shang is not accustomed to having her queries remain unanswered she said. One of the lesser breed should feel honoured that a member of the holy race that was born to inherit life eternal should deign even to notice him. Again the black smiled that wicked, knowing smile. Zodar, dator of the firstborn of Barsoom, is accustomed to give commands, not to receive them, replied the black pirate. Then, turning to me, what are your intentions concerning me? I intend taking you both back to Helium, I said. No harm will come to you. You will find the Red Men of Helium a kindly and magnanimous race. But if they listen to me, there will be no more voluntary pilgrimages down the river I.S.'s, and the impossible belief that they have cherished for ages will be shattered into a thousand pieces. Are you of Helium? he asked. 
I am a prince of the house of Tardos Mors, Jeddak of Helium, I replied, but I am not of Barsoom. I am of another world. Zodar looked at me intently for a few moments. I can well believe that you are not of Barsoom, he said at length. None of this world could have bested eight of the firstborn single-handed, but how is it that you wear the golden hair and the jeweled circlet of a holy thern? He emphasized the word holy with a touch of irony. I had forgotten them, I said. They are the spoils of conquest. And with a sweep of my hand, I removed the disguise from my head. When the black's eyes fell on my close-cropped black hair, they opened in astonishment. Evidently, he had looked for the bald pate of a thern. You are indeed of another world, he said, a touch of awe in his voice. With the skin of a thern, the black hair of a firstborn, and the muscles of a dozen daters. It was no disgrace even for Zodar to acknowledge your supremacy. A thing he could never do were you a Barsoomian, he added. You are traveling several laps ahead of me, my friend, I interrupted. I glean that your name is Zodar, but whom, pray, are the firstborn? And what a data, and why, if you were conquered by a Barsoomian, could you not acknowledge it? The firstborn of Barsoom, he explained are the race of black men of which I am a data, or, as the lesser Barsoomians would say, prince. My race is the oldest on the planet. We trace our lineage, unbroken, direct to the tree of life which flourished in the center of the valley door 23 million years ago. For countless ages, the fruit of this tree underwent the gradual changes of evolution, passing by degrees from true plant life to a combination of plant and animal. In the first stages, the fruit of the tree possessed only the power of independent muscular action while the stem remained attached to the parent plant. Later, a brain developed in the fruit, so that hanging there by their long stems they thought and moved as individuals. Then, with the development of perceptions came a comparison of them. Judgments were reached and compared, and thus reason and the power to reason were born upon Barsoom. Ages passed. Many forms of life came and went upon the tree of life, but still all were attached to the parent plant by stems of varying lengths. At length, the fruit tree consisted in tiny plant men, such as we now see reproduced in such huge dimensions in the valley door, but still hanging to the limbs and branches of the tree by the stems which grew from the tops of their heads. The buds from which the plant men blossomed resembled large nuts about a foot in diameter, divided by double partition walls into four sections. In one section grew the plant man, in another a sixteen-legged worm, in the third the progenitor of the white ape, and in the fourth the primeval black man of Barsoom. When the bud burst, the plant man remained dangling at the end of his stem, but the three other sections fell to the ground, where the efforts of their imprisoned occupants to escape sent them hopping about in all directions. Thus, as time went on, all Barsoom was covered with these imprisoned creatures. For countless ages, they lived their long lives within their hard shells, hopping and skipping about the broad planet, falling into rivers, lakes and seas, to be still further spread about the surface of the new world. Countless billions died before the first black man broke through his prison walls into the light of day. Prompted by curiosity, he broke open other shells, and the peopling of Barsoom commenced, and untainted by admixture with other creatures in the race of which I am a member. But from the sixteen-legged worm, the first ape and renegade black man has sprung every other form of animal life upon Barsoom. The therns, and he smiled maliciously as he spoke, are but the result of ages of evolution from the pure white ape of antiquity. They are a lower order still. There is but one race of true and immortal humans on Barsoom. It is the race of black men. The tree of life is dead, but before it died, the plant men learned to detach themselves from it and roam the face of Barsoom with the other children of the first parent. Now their bisexuality permits them to reproduce themselves after the manner of true plants, but otherwise they have progressed but little in all the ages of their existence. Their actions and movements are largely matters of instinct, and not guided to any great extent by reason. 
since the brain of a plant man is but a trifle larger than the end of your smallest finger. They live upon vegetation and the blood of animals, and their brain is just large enough to direct their movements in the direction of food and to translate the food sensations which are carried to it from their eyes and ears. They have no sense of self-preservation, and so are entirely without fear in the face of danger. That is why they are such terrible antagonists in combat. I wondered why the black man took such pains to discourse thus at length to enemies upon the genesis of life Barsoomian. It seemed a strangely inopportune moment for a proud member of a proud race to unbend in casual conversation with a captor, especially in view of the fact that the black still lay securely bound upon the deck. It was the faintest straying of his eye beyond me for the barest fraction of a second that explained his motive for thus dragging out my interest in his truly absorbing story. He lay a little forward of where I stood at the levers, and thus he faced the stern of the vessel as he addressed me. It was at the end of his description of the plant men that I caught his eye fixed momentarily upon something behind me. Nor could I be mistaken in the swift gleam of triumph that brightened those dark orbs for an instant. Some time before I had reduced our speed, for we had left the valley door many miles astern, and I felt comparatively safe. I turned an apprehensive glance behind me, and the sight that I saw froze the newborn hope of freedom that had been springing up within me. A great battleship, forging silent and unlighted through the dark night, loomed close astern. Chapter 8 the depths of Omean. Now I realized why the black pirate had kept me engrossed with his strange tale. For miles he had sensed the approach of succor, and but for that single telltale glance the battleship would have been directly above us in another moment, and the boarding party, which was doubtless even now swinging in their harness from the ship's keel, would have swarmed our deck, placing my rising hope of escape in sudden and total eclipse. I was too old a hand in aerial warfare to be at a loss now for the right manoeuvre. Simultaneously, I reversed the engines and dropped the little vessel a sheer hundred feet. Above my head, I could see the dangling forms of the boarding party as the battleship raced over us. Then I rose at a sharp angle, throwing my speed lever to its last notch. Like a bolt from a crossbow, my splendid craft shot its steel prow straight at the whirring propellers of the giant above us. If I could but touch them, the huge bulk would be disabled for hours and escape once more possible. At the same instant, the sun shot above the horizon, disclosing a hundred grim, black faces peering over the stern of the battleship upon us. At sight of us, a shout of rage went up from a hundred throats, Orders were shouted, but it was too late to save the giant propellers, and with a crash we rammed them. Instantly, with the shock of impact, I reversed my engine, but my prow was wedged in the hole it had made in the battleship's stern. Only a second I hung there before tearing away, but that second was amply long to swarm my deck with black devils. There was no fight. In the first place, there was no room to fight. We were simply submerged by numbers. Then, as swords menaced me, a command from Zodar stayed the hands of his fellows. Secure them, he said, but do not injure them. Several of the pirates already had released Zodar. He now personally attended to my disarming and saw that I was properly bound. At least he thought that the binding was secure. It would have been had I been a Martian, but I had to smile at the puny strands that confined my wrists. When the time came, I could snap them as they had been cotton string. The girl they bound also, and then they fastened us together. In the meantime, they had brought our craft alongside the disabled battleship, and soon we were transported to the latter's deck. Fully, a thousand black men manned the great engine of destruction. Her decks were crowded with them as they pressed forward as far as discipline would permit to get a glimpse of their captives. The girl's beauty elicited many brutal comments and vulgar jests, 
It was evident that these self-thought supermen were far inferior to the red men of Barsoom in refinement and in chivalry. My close-cropped black hair and thern complexion were the subjects of much comment. When Zodar told his fellow nobles of my fighting ability and strange origin, they crowded about me with numerous questions. The fact that I wore the harness and metal of a thern who had been killed by a member of my party convinced them that I was an enemy of their hereditary foes and placed me on a better footing in their estimation. Without exception, the blacks were handsome men and well-built. The officers were conspicuous through the wondrous magnificence of their resplendent trappings. Many harnesses were so encrusted with gold, platinum, silver and precious stones as to entirely hide the leather beneath. The harness of the commanding officer was a solid mass of diamonds. Against the ebony background of his skin, they blazed out with a peculiarly accentuated effulgence. The whole scene was enchanting. The handsome men, the barbaric splendor of the accoutrements, the polished skeel wood of the deck, the gloriously grained serapis of the cabins, inlaid with priceless jewels and precious metals in intricate and beautiful design, the burnished gold of handrails, the shining metal of the guns. Fidor and I were taken below decks, where, still fast-bound, we were thrown into a small compartment which contained a single porthole. As our escort left us, they barred the door behind them. We could hear the men working on the broken propellers, and from the porthole we could see that the vessel was drifting lazily toward the south. For some time, neither of us spoke. Each was occupied with his own thoughts. For my part, I was wondering as to the fate of Tars Tarkas and the girl Thuvia. Even if they succeeded in eluding pursuit, they must eventually fall into the hands of either red men or green, and as fugitives from the valley door, they could look for but little else than a swift and terrible death. How I wished that I might have accompanied them. It seemed to me that I could not fail to impress upon the intelligent red men of Barsoom the wicked deception that a cruel and senseless superstition had foisted upon them. Tardos Moors would believe me. Of that, I was positive, and that he would have the courage of his convictions my knowledge of his character assured me. Dejah Thoris would believe me. Not a doubt as to that entered my head. Then there were a thousand of my red and green warrior friends whom I knew would face eternal damnation gladly for my sake. Like Tars Tarkas, where I led, they would follow. My only danger lay in that should I ever escape the black pirates it might be to fall into the hands of unfriendly red or green men, then it would mean short shrift for me. Well, there seemed little to worry about on that score, for the likelihood of my ever escaping the blacks was extremely remote. The girl and I were linked together by a rope, which permitted us to move only about three or four feet from each other. When we had entered the compartment, we had seated ourselves upon a low bench beneath the porthole. The bench was the only furniture of the room. It was of sorapus wood. The floor, ceiling and walls were of carborundum aluminum, a light, impenetrable composition extensively utilized in the construction of Martian fighting ships. As I had sat meditating upon the future, my eyes had been riveted upon the porthole which was just level with them as I sat. Suddenly, I looked toward Fida. She was regarding me with a strange expression I had not before seen upon her face. She was very beautiful then. Instantly, her white lids veiled her eyes, and I thought I discovered a delicate flush tinging her cheek. Evidently, she was embarrassed at having been detected in the act of staring at a lesser creature, I thought. Do you find the study of the lower orders interesting? I asked, laughing. She looked up again with a nervous but relieved little laugh. Oh, very, she said, especially when they have such excellent profiles. It was my turn to flush, but I did not. I felt that she was poking fun at me, and I admired a brave heart that could look for humor on the road to death, and so I laughed with her. Do you know where we are going? she said. To solve the mystery of the eternal hereafter, I imagine, I replied. I am going to a worse fate than that, she said, with a little shudder. What do you mean? 
I can only guess, she replied. Since no thern damsel of all the millions that have been stolen away by black pirates during the ages, they have raided our domains has ever returned to narrate her experiences among them. That they never take a man prisoner lends strength to the belief that the fate of the girls they steal is worse than death. Is it not a just retribution? I could not help but ask. What do you mean? Do not the therns themselves do likewise with the poor creatures who take the voluntary pilgrimage down the river of mystery? Was not Thuvia for fifteen years a plaything and a slave? Is it less than just that you should suffer as you have caused others to suffer? You do not understand, she replied. We therns are a holy race. It is an honor to a lesser creature to be a slave among us. Did we not occasionally save a few of the lower orders that stupidly float down an unknown river to an unknown end, all would become the prey of the plant men and the apes. But do you not by every means encourage the superstition among those of the outside world, I argued. That is the wickedest of your deeds. Can you tell me why you foster the cruel deception? All life on Barsoom, she said is created solely for the support of the race of therns. How else could we live did the outer world not furnish our labor and our food? Think you that a thern would demean himself by labor? It is true then that you eat human flesh, I asked in horror. She looked at me in pitying commiseration for my ignorance. Truly, we eat the flesh of the lower orders. Do not you also? The flesh of beasts, yes, I replied but not the flesh of man. As man may eat of the flesh of beasts, so may gods eat of the flesh of man. The holy therns are the gods of Barsoom. I was disgusted, and I imagine that I showed it. You are an unbeliever now, she continued gently, but should we be fortunate enough to escape the clutches of the black pirates and come again to the court of Matai Shang, I think that we shall find an argument to convince you of the error of your ways, and... She hesitated. Perhaps we shall find a way to keep you as, as, one of us. Again, her eyes dropped to the floor, and a faint color suffused her cheek. I could not understand her meaning, nor did I for a long time. Deja Thoris was wont to say that in some things I was a veritable simpleton, and I guessed that she was right. I fear that I would ill requite your father's hospitality, I answered since the first thing that I should do were I a thern would be to set an armed guard at the mouth of the river Iases to escort the poor deluded voyagers back to the outer world. Also should I devote my life to the extermination of the hideous plant men and their horrible companions, the great white apes. She looked at me really horror-struck. No, no, she cried. You must not say such terribly sacrilegious things. You must not even think them. Should they ever guess that you entertained such frightful thoughts, should we chance to regain the temples of the therns, they would mete out a frightful death to you. Not even my... my... Again she flushed and started over. Not even I could save you. I said no more. Evidently it was useless. She was even more steeped in superstition than the Martians of the outer world. They only worshipped a beautiful hope for a life of love and peace and happiness in the hereafter. The therns worshipped the hideous plant men and the apes, or at least they reverenced them as the abodes of the departed spirits of their own dead. At this point, the door of our prison opened to admit Zodar. He smiled pleasantly at me, and when he smiled his expression was kindly anything but cruel or vindictive. Since you cannot escape under any circumstances, he said, I cannot see the necessity for keeping you confined below. I will cut your bonds and you may come on deck. You will witness something very interesting, and as you never shall return to the outer world, it will do no harm to permit you to see it. You will see what no other than the firstborn and their slaves know the existence of the subterranean entrance to the Holy Land, to the real heaven of Barsoom. It will be an excellent lesson for this daughter of the Therns, he added, for she shall see the temple of Issus, and Issus, perchance, shall embrace her. Fidor's head went high. What blasphemy is this dog of a pirate, she cried. 
Issus would wipe out your entire breed and you ever came within sight of a temple. You have much to learn, Thern, replied Xodar with an ugly smile, nor do I envy you the manner in which you will learn it. As we came on deck, I saw to my surprise that the vessel was passing over a great field of snow and ice. As far as the eye could reach in any direction, naught else was visible. There could be but one solution to the mystery. We were above the South Polar ice cap. Only at the poles of Mars is there ice or snow upon the planet. No sign of life appeared below us. Evidently, we were too far south even for the great fur-bearing animals which the Martians so delight in hunting. Zodar was at my side as I stood looking out over the ship's rail. What course? I asked him. A little west of south, he replied. You will see the Otz Valley directly. We shall skirt it for a few hundred miles. The Otz Valley, I exclaimed. But man, is not there where lie the domains of the therns from which I but just escaped? Yes, answered Zodar. You crossed this ice field last night in the long chase that you led us. The Otz Valley lies in a mighty depression at the South Pole. It is sunk thousands of feet below the level of the surrounding country like a great round bowl. A hundred miles from its northern boundary rise the Otz Mountains which circle the inner valley of Dor, in the exact center of which lies the lost sea of Chorus. On the shore of this sea stands the golden temple of Issus in the land of the firstborn. It is there that we are bound. As I looked, I commenced to realize why it was that in all the ages only one had escaped from the valley door. My only wonder was that even the one had been successful. To cross this frozen, wind-swept waste of bleak ice alone and on foot would be impossible. Only by airboat could the journey be made, I finished aloud. It was thus that one did escape the therns in bygone times, but none has ever escaped the firstborn, said Zodar, with a touch of pride in his voice. We had now reached the southernmost extremity of the great ice barrier. It ended abruptly in a sheer wall, thousands of feet high at the base of which stretched a level valley, broken here and there by low rolling hills and little clumps of forest, and with tiny rivers formed by the melting of the ice barrier at its base. Once we passed far above what seemed to be a deep canyon-like rift, stretching from the ice wall on the north across the valley as far as the eye could reach. That is the bed of the River Ices, said Zodar. It runs far beneath the ice field, and below the level of the Valley Otz, but its canyon is open here. Presently I described what I took to be a village, and pointing it out to Zodar, asked him what it might be. It is a village of lost souls, he answered, laughing. This strip between the ice barrier and the mountains is considered neutral ground. Some turn off from their voluntary pilgrimage down the ISs, and scaling the awful walls of its canyon below us, stop in the valley. Also, a slave now and then escapes from the therns and makes his way hither. They do not attempt to recapture such, since there is no escape from this outer valley. And as a matter of fact, they fear the patrolling cruisers of the firstborn too much to venture from their own domains. The poor creatures of this outer valley are not molested by us, since they have nothing that we desire, nor are they numerically strong enough to give us an interesting fight, so we too leave them alone. There are several villages of them, but they have increased in numbers but little in many years, since they are always warring among themselves. Now we swung a little north of west, leaving the valley of lost souls, and shortly I discerned over our starboard bow what appeared to be a black mountain rising from the desolate waste of ice. It was not high and seemed to have a flat top. Xodar had left us to attend to some duty on the vessel, and Fidor and I stood alone beside the rail. The girl had not once spoken since we had been brought to the deck. Is what he has been telling me true? I asked her. In part, yes, she answered. That about the outer valley is true, but what he says of the location of the Temple of Issus in the center of his country is false. If it is not false, she hesitated. Oh, it cannot be true. It cannot be true. For if it were true, then for countless ages, 
have my people gone to torture and ignominious death at the hands of their cruel enemies, instead of to the beautiful life eternal that we have been taught to believe Issus holds for us? As the lesser Barsoomians of the outer world have been lured by you to the terrible valley door, so may it be that the Therns themselves have been lured by the firstborn to an equally horrid fate, I suggested. It would be a stern and awful retribution, Fidor, but a just one. I cannot believe it, she said. We shall see, I answered, and then we fell silent again, for we were rapidly approaching the Black Mountains, which in some indefinable way seemed linked with the answer to our problem. As we neared the dark, truncated cone, the vessel's speed was diminished until we barely moved. Then we topped the crest of the mountain, and below us I saw yawning the mouth of a huge circular well, the bottom of which was lost in inky blackness. The diameter of this enormous pit was fully a thousand feet. The walls were smooth and appeared to be composed of a black, basaltic rock. For a moment, the vessel hovered motionless directly above the center of the gaping void, then slowly she began to settle into the black chasm. Lower and lower she sank, until as darkness enveloped us, her lights were thrown on, and in the dim halo of her own radiance, the monster battleship dropped on and on down into what seemed to me must be the very bowels of Barsoom. For quite half an hour we descended, and then the shaft terminated abruptly in the dome of a mighty subterranean world. Below us rose and fell the billows of a buried sea. A phosphorescent radiance illuminated the scene. Thousands of ships dotted the bosom of the ocean. Little islands rose here and there to support the strange and colorless vegetation of this strange world. Slowly and with majestic grace, the battleship dropped until she rested on the water. Her great propellers had been drawn and housed during our descent of the shaft, and in their place had been run out the smaller but more powerful water propellers. As these commenced to revolve, the ship took up its journey once more, riding the new element as buoyantly and as safely as she had the air. Fidor and I were dumbfounded. Neither had either heard or dreamed that such a world existed beneath the surface of Barsoom. Nearly all the vessels we saw were warcraft. There were a few lighters and barges, but none of the great merchantmen such as ply the upper air between the cities of the outer world. Here is the harbour of the navy of the firstborn, said a voice behind us, and turning we saw Zodar watching us with an amused smile on his lips. This sea, he continued, is larger than Chorus. It receives the waters of the lesser sea above it. To keep it from filling above a certain level, we have four great pumping stations that force the oversupply back into the reservoirs far north from which the red men draw the water which irrigates their farmlands. A new light burst on me with this explanation. The red men had always considered it a miracle that caused great columns of water to spurt from the solid rock of their reservoir sides to increase the supply of the precious liquid which is so scarce in the outer world of Mars. Never had their learned men been able to fathom the secret of the source of this enormous volume of water. As ages passed, they had simply come to accept it as a matter of course and ceased to question its origin. We passed several islands on which were strangely shaped circular buildings, apparently roofless, and pierced midway between the ground and their tops with small, heavily barred windows. They bore the earmarks of prisons, which were further accentuated by the armed guards who squatted on low benches without or patrolled the short beach lines. Few of these islets contained over an acre of ground, but presently we sighted a much larger one directly ahead. This proved to be our destination, and the great ship was soon made fast against the steep shore. Zodar signalled us to follow him, and with a half-dozen officers and men we left the battleship and approached a large oval structure a couple of hundred yards from the shore. You shall soon see Issus, said Zodar to Fidor. The few prisoners we take are presented to her. Occasionally she selects slaves from among them to replenish the ranks of her handmaidens. None serves Issus above a single year, 
and there was a grim smile on the black's lips that lent a cruel and sinister meaning to his simple statement. Fidor, though loath to believe that Issus was allied to such as these, had commenced to entertain doubts and fears. She clung very closely to me, no longer the proud daughter of the master of life and death upon Barsoom, but a young and frightened girl in the power of relentless enemies. The building which we now entered was entirely roofless. In its centre was a long tank of water set below the level of the floor like the swimming pool of a natatorium. Near one side of the pool floated an odd-looking black object. Whether it were some strange monster of these buried waters or a queer raft, I could not at once perceive. We were soon to know, however, for as we reached the edge of the pool directly above the thing, Zodar cried out a few words in a strange tongue. Immediately, a hatch cover was raised from the surface of the object, and a black seaman sprang from the bowels of the strange craft. Zodar addressed the seaman. Transmit to your officer, he said, the commands of Data Zodar. Say to him that Data Zodar, with officers and men, escorting two prisoners, would be transported to the gardens of Issus beside the Golden Temple. Blessed be the shell of thy first ancestor, most noble Data, replied the man. It shall be done even as thou sayest. And raising both hands, palms backward, above his head, after the manner of salute which is common to all races of Barsoom, he disappeared once more into the entrails of his ship. A moment later, an officer resplendent in the gorgeous trappings of his rank appeared on deck and welcomed Xodar to the vessel, and in the latter's wake we filed aboard and below. The cabin in which we found ourselves extended entirely across the ship, having portholes on either side below the waterline. No sooner were all below than a number of commands were given, in accordance with which the hatch was closed and secured, and the vessel commenced to vibrate to the rhythmic purr of its machinery. Where can we be going in such a tiny pool of water? asked Fidor. Not up, I replied for I noticed particularly that while the building is roofless, it is covered with a strong metal grating. Then where? she asked again. From the appearance of the craft, I judge we are going down, I replied. Fidor shuddered. For such long ages have the waters of Barsoom seas been a thing of tradition, only that even this daughter of the Therns, born as she had been within sight of Mars only remaining sea, had the same terror of deep water as is a common attribute of all Martians. Presently the sensation of sinking became very apparent. We were going down swiftly. Now we could hear the water rushing past the portholes, and in the dim light that filtered through them to the water beyond, the swirling eddies were plainly visible. Fidor grasped my arm. Save me, she whispered. Save me, and your every wish shall be granted. Anything within the power of the Holy Therns to give will be yours. Fidor, she stumbled a little here, and then in a very low voice, Fidor already is yours. I felt very sorry for the poor child, and placed my hand over hers where it rested on my arm. I presume my motive was misunderstood, for with a swift glance about the apartment to assure herself that we were alone, she threw both her arms about my neck and dragged my face down to hers. Chapter 9 Issus, Goddess of Life Eternal the confession of love which the girl's fright had wrung from her touched me deeply, but it humiliated me as well, since I felt that in some thoughtless word or act I had given her reason to believe that I reciprocated her affection. Never have I been much of a ladies' man, being more concerned with fighting and kindred arts which have ever seemed to me more befitting a man than mooning over a scented glove four sizes too small for him, or kissing a dead flower that has begun to smell like a cabbage. So I was quite at a loss as to what to do or say. A thousand times rather face the wild hordes of the dead sea bottoms than meet the eyes of this beautiful young girl and tell her the thing that I must tell her. But there was nothing else to be done, and so I did it. Very clumsily, too, I fear. Gently I unclasped her hands from about my neck, and still holding them in mine, I told her the story of my love for Deja Thoris. 
that of all the women of two worlds that I had known and admired during my long life, she alone had I loved. The tale did not seem to please her. Like a tigress, she sprang, panting to her feet. Her beautiful face was distorted in an expression of horrible malevolence. Her eyes fairly blazed into mine. Dog, she hissed, dog of a blasphemer. Think you that Fedor, daughter of Matai Shang, supplicates? She commands. What to her is your puny outer world passion for the vile creature you chose in your other life? Fidor has glorified you with her love, and you have spurned her. Ten thousand unthinkably atrocious deaths could not atone for the affront that you have put upon me. The thing that you call Dejah Thoris shall die the most horrible of them all. You have sealed the warrant for her doom. And you, you shall be the meanest slave in the service of the goddess you have attempted to humiliate. Tortures and ignominies shall be heaped upon you until you grovel at my feet, asking the boon of death. In my gracious generosity, I shall at length grant your prayer, and from the high balcony of the golden cliffs, I shall watch the great white apes tear you asunder. She had it all fixed up, the whole lovely program from start to finish. It amazed me to think that one so divinely beautiful could at the same time be so fiendishly vindictive. It occurred to me, however, that she had overlooked one little factor in her revenge, and so, without any intent to add to her discomfiture, but rather to permit her to rearrange her plans along more practical lines, I pointed to the nearest porthole. Evidently, she had entirely forgotten her surroundings and her present circumstances, for a single glance at the dark, swirling waters without sent her crumpled upon a low bench, where with her face buried in her arms, she sobbed more like a very unhappy little girl than a proud and all-powerful goddess. Down, down, we continued to sink until the heavy glass of the portholes became noticeably warm from the heat of the water without. Evidently, we were very far beneath the surface crust of Mars. Presently, our downward motion ceased, and I could hear the propellers swirling through the water at our stern and forcing us ahead at high speed. It was very dark down there, but the light from our portholes and the reflection from what must have been a powerful searchlight on the submarine's nose showed that we were forging through a narrow passage, rock-lined and tube-like. After a few minutes, the propellers ceased their whirring. We came to a full stop and then commenced to rise swiftly toward the surface. Soon, the light from without increased and we came to a stop. Zodar entered the cabin with his men. Come, he said, and we followed him through the hatchway, which had been opened by one of the seamen. We found ourselves in a small subterranean vault in the center of which was the pool in which lay our submarine, floating as we had first seen her with only her black back showing. Around the edge of the pool was a level platform, and then the walls of the cave rose perpendicularly for a few feet to arch toward the center of the low roof. The walls about the ledge were pierced with a number of entrances to dimly lighted passageways. Toward one of these our captors led us, and after a short walk halted before a steel cage which lay at the bottom of a shaft rising above us as far as one could see. The cage proved to be one of the common types of elevator cars that I had seen in other parts of Barsoom. They are operated by means of enormous magnets which are suspended at the top of the shaft. By an electrical device, the volume of magnetism generated is regulated and the speed of the car varied. In long stretches, they move at a sickening speed, especially on the upward trip, since the small force of gravity inherent to Mars results in very little opposition to the powerful force above. Scarcely had the door of the car closed behind us than we were slowing up to stop at the landing above. So rapid was our ascent of the long shaft. When we emerged from the little building which houses the upper terminus of the elevator, we found ourselves in the midst of a veritable fairyland of beauty. The combined languages of Earthmen hold no words to convey to the mind the gorgeous beauties of the scene. One may speak of scarlet sward and ivory stem trees decked with brilliant purple blooms, 
of winding walks paved with crushed rubies, with emerald, with turquoise, even with diamonds themselves, of a magnificent temple of burnished gold, hand-wrought with marvellous designs. But where are the words to describe the glorious colours that are unknown to earthly eyes? Where the mind or the imagination that can grasp the gorgeous scintillations of unheard of rays as they emanate from the thousand nameless jewels of Barsoom? Even my eyes, for long years accustomed to the barbaric splendours of a Martian Jeddak's court, were amazed at the glory of the scene. Fidor's eyes were wide in amazement. The Temple of Issus, she whispered, half to herself. Zodar watched us with his grim smile, partly of amusement and partly malicious gloating. The gardens swarmed with brilliantly trapped black men and women. Among them moved red and white females serving their every want. The places of the outer world and the temples of the Therns had been robbed of their princesses and goddesses that the blacks might have their slaves. Through this scene, we moved toward the temple. At the main entrance, we were halted by a cordon of armed guards. Xodar spoke a few words to an officer who came forward to question us. Together, they entered the temple, where they remained for some time. When they returned, it was to announce that Issus desired to look upon the daughter of Matai Shang and the strange creature from another world who had been a prince of helium. Slowly, we moved through endless corridors of unthinkable beauty, through magnificent apartments and noble halls. At length, we were halted in a spacious chamber in the center of the temple. One of the officers who had accompanied us advanced to a large door in the further end of the chamber. Here, he must have made some sort of signal for immediately the door opened and another richly trapped courtier emerged. We were then led up to the door, where we were directed to get down on our hands and knees with our backs toward the room we were to enter. The doors were swung open, and after being cautioned not to turn our heads under penalty of instant death, we were commanded to back into the presence of Issus. Never have I been in so humiliating a position in my life, and only my love for Dejah Thoris and the hope which still clung to me that I might again see her kept me from rising to face the goddess of the firstborn and go down to my death like a gentleman, facing my foes and with their blood mingling with mine. After we had crawled in this disgusting fashion for a matter of a couple of hundred feet, we were halted by our escort. Let them rise, said a voice behind us, a thin, wavering voice, yet one that had evidently been accustomed to command for many years. Rise, said our escort, but do not face toward Issus. The woman pleases me, said the thin, wavering voice again after a few moments of silence. She shall serve me the allotted time. The man you may return to the Isle of Shadow, which lies against the northern shore of the Sea of Omean. Let the woman turn and look upon Issus, knowing that those of the lower orders who gaze upon the holy vision of her radiant face survive the blinding glory, but a single year. I watched Fidor from the corner of my eye. She paled to a ghastly hue. Slowly, very slowly she turned, as though drawn by some invisible yet irresistible force. She was standing quite close to me, so close that her bare arm touched mine as she finally faced Issus, goddess of life eternal. I could not see the girl's face as her eyes rested for the first time on the supreme deity of Mars, but felt the shudder that ran through her in the trembling flesh of the arm that touched mine. It must be dazzling loveliness indeed, thought I, to cause such emotion in the breast of so radiant a beauty as Fidor, daughter of Matai Shang. Let the woman remain. Remove the man. Go. Thus spoke Issus, and the heavy hand of the officer fell upon my shoulder. In accordance with his instructions, I dropped to my hands and knees once more and crawled from the presence. It had been my first audience with deity, but I am free to confess that I was not greatly impressed, other than with the ridiculous figure I cut scrambling about on my marrow bones. Once without the chamber, the doors closed behind us, and I was bid to rise. Zodar joined me, and together 
we slowly retraced our steps toward the gardens. You spared my life when you easily might have taken it, he said, after we had proceeded some little way in silence, and I would aid you if I might. I can help to make your life here more bearable, but your fate is inevitable. You may never hope to return to the outer world. What will be my fate? I asked. That will depend largely upon Issus. So long as she does not send for you and reveal her face to you, you may live on for years in as mild a form of bondage as I can arrange for you. Why should she send for me? I asked. The men of the lower orders she often uses for various purposes of amusement. Such a fighter as you, for example, would render fine sport in the monthly rites of the temple. There are men pitted against men and against beasts for the edification of Issus and the replenishment of her larder. She eats human flesh? I asked. Not in horror, however, for since my recently acquired knowledge of the Holy Therns, I was prepared for anything in this still less accessible heaven, where all was evidently dictated by a single omnipotence, where ages of narrow fanaticism and self-worship had eradicated all the broader humanitarian instincts that the race might once have possessed. They were a people drunk with power and success, looking upon the other inhabitants of Mars as we look upon the beasts of the field and the forest. Why then should they not eat of the flesh of the lower orders, whose lives and characters they no more understood, than do we the inmost thoughts and sensibilities of the cattle we slaughter for our earthly tables? She eats only the flesh of the best bread of the Holy Therns and the Red Barsoomians. The flesh of the others goes to our boards. The animals are eaten by the slaves. She also eats other dainties. I did not understand then that there lay any special significance in his reference to other dainties. I thought the limit of ghoulishness already had been reached in the recitation of Issus's menu. I still had much to learn as to the depths of cruelty and bestiality to which omnipotence may drag its possessor. We had about reached the last of the many chambers and corridors which led to the gardens when an officer overtook us. Issus would look again upon this man, he said. The girl has told her that he is of wondrous beauty and of such prowess that alone he slew seven of the firstborn and with his bare hands took Zodar captive, binding him with his own harness. Zodar looked uncomfortable. Evidently he did not relish the thought that Issus had learned of his inglorious defeat. Without a word he turned, and we followed the officer once again to the closed doors before the audience chamber of Issus, goddess of life eternal. Here the ceremony of entrance was repeated. Again Issus bid me rise. For several minutes all was silent as the tomb. The eyes of deity were appraising me. Presently, the thin, wavering voice broke the stillness, repeating in a sing-song drone the words which for countless ages had sealed the doom of numberless victims. Let the man turn and look upon Issus, knowing that those of the lower orders who gaze upon the holy vision of her radiant face survive the blinding glory but a single year. I turned as I had been bid expecting such a treat as only the revealment of divine glory to mortal eyes might produce. What I saw was a solid phalanx of armed men between myself and a dais supporting a great bench of carved serapus wood. On this bench, or throne, squatted a female black. She was evidently very old, not a hair remained upon her wrinkled skull. With the exception of two yellow fangs, she was entirely toothless. On either side of her thin, hawk-like nose, her eyes burned from the depths of horribly sunken sockets. The skin of her face was seamed and creased with a million deep-cut furrows. Her body was as wrinkled as her face and as repulsive, emaciated arms and legs attached to a torso which seemed to be mostly distorted abdomen completed the holy vision of her radiant beauty. Surrounding her were a number of female slaves, among them Fidor, white and trembling. This is the man who slew seven of the firstborn and barehanded bound Data Zodar with his own harness? asked Issus. Most glorious vision of divine loveliness it is, replied the officer who stood at my side. 
Produce Data Zodar, she commanded. Zodar was brought from the adjoining room. Issus glared at him, a baleful light in her hideous eyes. And such as you are a data of the firstborn, she squealed. For the disgrace you have brought upon the immortal race, you shall be degraded to a rank below the lowest. No longer be you a data, but forevermore a slave of slaves, to fetch and carry for the lower orders that serve in the gardens of Issus. Remove his harness. Cowards and slaves wear no trappings. Zodar stood stiffly erect. Not a muscle twitched, nor a tremor shook his giant frame as a soldier of the guard roughly stripped his gorgeous trappings from him. Begone! screamed the infuriated little old woman. Begone! But instead of the light of the gardens of Issus, let you serve as a slave of this slave who conquered you in the prison on the Isle of Shadda in the Sea of Omean. Take him away out of the sight of my divine eyes. Slowly and with high-held head, the proud Zodar turned and stalked from the chamber. Issus rose and turned to leave the room by another exit. Turning to me, she said, You shall be returned to Shadda for the present. Later, Issus will see the manner of your fighting. Go. Then she disappeared, followed by her retinue. Only Fidor lagged behind, and as I started to follow my guard toward the gardens, the girl came running after me. Oh, do not leave me in this terrible place, she begged. Forgive the things I said to you, my prince. I did not mean them. Only take me away with you. Let me share your imprisonment on Shadar. Her words were an almost incoherent volley of thoughts, so rapidly she spoke. You did not understand the honor that I did you. Among the therns there is no marriage or giving in marriage, as among the lower orders of the outer world. We might have lived together forever in love and happiness. We have both looked upon Issus, and in a year we die. Let us live that year at least together, in what measure of joy remains for the doomed. If it was difficult for me to understand you, Fidor, I replied, can you not understand that possibly it is equally difficult for you to understand the motives, the customs, and the social laws that guide me? I do not wish to hurt you, nor to seem to undervalue the honor which you have done me, but the thing you desire may not be. Regardless of the foolish belief of the peoples of the outer world, or of Holy Thern, or Eben Firstborn, I am not dead. While I live, my heart beats for but one woman, the incomparable Dejah Thoris, Princess of Helium. When death overtakes me, my heart shall have ceased to beat, but what comes after that I know not. And in that I am as wise as Matai Shang, master of life and death upon Barsoom, or Issus, goddess of life eternal. Fidor stood looking at me intently for a moment, no anger showed in her eyes this time, only a pathetic expression of hopeless sorrow. I do not understand, she said, and turning walked slowly in the direction of the door through which Issus and her retinue had passed. A moment later, she had passed from my sight. Chapter 10 The Prison Isle of Shadda In the outer gardens to which the guard now escorted me, I found Zodar surrounded by a crowd of noble blacks. They were reviling and cursing him. The men slapped his face. The women spat upon him. When I appeared, they turned their attentions toward me. Ah, cried one, so this is the creature who overcame the great Zodar barehanded. Let us see how it was done. Let him bind Thurid, suggested a beautiful woman, laughing. Thurid is a noble data. Let Thurid show the dog what it means to face a real man. Yes, Thurid, Thurid, cried a dozen voices. Here he is now, exclaimed another, and turning in the direction indicated, I saw a huge black weighed down with resplendent ornaments and arms advancing with noble and gallant bearing toward us. What now? he cried. What would you of Thurid? Quickly a dozen voices explained. Thurid turned toward Zodar, his eyes narrowing to two nasty slits. Kalot, he hissed, ever did I think you carried the heart of a Sorak in your putrid breast. Often have you bested me in the secret councils of Issus, 
But now in the field of war, where men are truly gauged, your scabby heart hath revealed its sores to all the world. Calot, I spurn you with my foot, and with the words he turned to kick Zodar. My blood was up. For minutes it had been boiling at the cowardly treatment they had been according this once powerful comrade because he had fallen from the favour of Issus. I had no love for Zodar, but I cannot stand the sight of cowardly injustice and persecution without seeing red as through a haze of bloody mist and doing things on the impulse of the moment that I presume I never should do after mature deliberation. I was standing close beside Zodar as Thurid swung his foot for the cowardly kick. The degraded data stood erect and motionless as a carven image. He was prepared to take whatever his former comrades had to offer in the way of insults and reproaches, and take them in manly silence and stoicism. But as Thurid's foot swung, so did mine, and I caught him a painful blow upon the shin bone that saved Zodar from this added ignominy. For a moment there was tense silence. Then Thurid, with a roar of rage, sprang for my throat, just as Zodar had upon the deck of the cruiser. The results were identical. I ducked beneath his outstretched arms, and as he lunged past me, planted a terrific right on the side of his jaw. The big fellow spun around like a top, his knees gave beneath him, and he crumpled to the ground at my feet. The blacks gazed in astonishment, first at the still form of the proud data lying there in the ruby dust of the pathway, then at me as though they could not believe that such a thing could be. You asked me to bind Thurid, I cried. Behold! And then I stooped beside the prostrate form, tore the harness from it, and bound the fellow's arms and legs securely. As you have done to Zodar, now do you likewise to Thurid. Take him before Issus, bound in his own harness, that she may see with her own eyes that there be one among you now who is greater than the firstborn. Who are you? whispered the woman who had first suggested that I attempt to bind Thurid. I am a citizen of two worlds, Captain John Carter of Virginia, Prince of the House of Tardos Moors, Jeddak of Helium. Take this man to your goddess, as I have said, and tell her too that as I have done to Zodar and Thurid, so also can I do to the mightiest of her daters. With naked hands, with long sword or with short sword, I challenge the flower of her fighting men to combat. Come, said the officer who was guarding me back to Shadda. My orders are imperative. There is to be no delay. Zodar, come you also. There was little of disrespect in the tone that the man used in addressing either Zodar or myself. It was evident that he felt less contempt for the former Dator since he had witnessed the ease with which I disposed of the powerful Thurid. That his respect for me was greater than it should have been for a slave was quite apparent from the fact that during the balance of the return journey he walked or stood always behind me, a drawn short sword in his hand. The return to the Sea of Omean was uneventful. We dropped down the awful shaft in the same car that had brought us to the surface. There we entered the submarine, taking the long dive to the tunnel far beneath the upper world. Then through the tunnel and up again to the pool from which we had had our first introduction to the wonderful passageway from Omean to the Temple of Issus. From the island of the submarine we were transported on a small cruiser to the distant Isle of Shador. Here we found a small stone prison and a guard of half a dozen blacks. There was no ceremony wasted in completing our incarceration. One of the blacks opened the door of the prison with a huge key. We walked in, the door closed behind us, the lock grated, and with the sound there swept over me again that terrible feeling of hopelessness that I had felt in the chamber of mystery in the golden cliffs beneath the gardens of the holy therns. Then Tars Tarkas had been with me, but now I was utterly alone in so far as friendly companionship was concerned. I fell to wondering about the fate of the great Thark and of his beautiful companion, the girl, Thuvia. Even should they by some miracle have escaped and been received and spared by a friendly nation, what hope had I of the succour which I knew they would gladly extend if it lay in their power? They could not guess my whereabouts or my fate, 
for none on all Barsoom even dream of such a place as this. Nor would it have advantaged me any had they known the exact location of my prison, for who could hope to penetrate to this buried sea in the face of the mighty navy of the firstborn? No, my case was hopeless. Well, I would make the best of it, and rising, I swept aside the brooding despair that had been endeavouring to claim me. With the idea of exploring my prison, I started to look around. Xodar sat, with bowed head, upon a low stone bench near the centre of the room in which we were. He had not spoken since Issus had degraded him. The building was roofless, the walls rising to a height of about thirty feet. Halfway up were a couple of small, heavily barred windows. The prison was divided into several rooms by partitions twenty feet high. There was no one in the room which we occupied, but two doors which led to other rooms were opened. I entered one of these rooms, but found it vacant. Thus, I continued through several of the chambers, until in the last one I found a young red Martian boy sleeping upon the stone bench which constituted the only furniture of any of the prison cells. Evidently, he was the only other prisoner. As he slept, I leaned over and looked at him. There was something strangely familiar about his face, and yet I could not place him. His features were very regular, and like the proportions of his graceful limbs and body, beautiful in the extreme. He was very light in colour for a red man, but in other respects he seemed a typical specimen of this handsome race. I did not awaken him, for sleep in prison is such a priceless boon that I have seen men transformed into raging brutes when robbed by one of their fellow prisoners of a few precious moments of it. Returning to my own cell, I found Zodar still sitting in the same position in which I had left him. Man, I cried, it will profit you nothing to mope thus. It were no disgrace to be bested by John Carter. You have seen that in the ease with which I accounted for Thurid. You knew it before when on the cruiser's deck you saw me slay three of your comrades. I would that you had dispatched me at the same time, he said. Come, come, I cried. There is hope yet. Neither of us is dead. We are great fighters. Why not win to freedom? He looked at me in amazement. You know not of what you speak, he replied. Issus is omnipotent. Issus is omniscient. She hears now the words you speak. She knows the thoughts you think. It is sacrilege even to dream of breaking her commands. Rot, Zodar, I ejaculated impatiently. He sprang to his feet in horror. The curse of Issus will fall upon you, he cried. In another instant, you will be smitten down, writhing to your death in horrible agony. Do you believe that, Zodar? I asked. Of course, who would dare doubt? I doubt, yes, and further I deny, I said. Why, Zodar, you tell me that she even knows my thoughts. The Red Men have all had that power for ages, and another wonderful power. They can shut their minds so that none may read their thoughts. I learned the first secret years ago. The other I never had to learn, since upon all Barsoom is none who can read what passes in the secret chambers of my brain. Your goddess cannot read my thoughts, nor can she read yours when you're out of sight, unless you will it. Had she been able to read mine, I'm afraid that her pride would have suffered a rather severe shock when I turned at her command to gaze upon the holy vision of her radiant face. What do you mean? he whispered, in an affrighted voice, so low that I could scarcely hear him. I mean that I thought her the most repulsive and vilely hideous creature my eyes ever had rested upon. For a moment, he eyed me in horror-stricken amazement, and then, with a cry of blasphemer, he sprang upon me. I did not wish to strike him again, nor was it necessary, since he was unarmed, and therefore quite harmless to me. As he came, I grasped his left wrist with my left hand, and swinging my right arm about his left shoulder, caught him beneath the chin with my elbow, and bore him backward across my thigh. There he hung helpless for a moment, glaring up at me in impotent rage. Zodar, I said, let us be friends. For a year, possibly, we may be forced to live together in the narrow confines of this tiny room. I am sorry to have offended you, 
but I could not dream that one who had suffered from the cruel injustice of Issus still could believe her divine. I will say a few more words, Xodar, with no intent to wound your feelings further, but rather that you may give thought to the fact that while we live, we are still more the arbiters of our own fate than is any god. Issus, you see, has not struck me dead, nor is she rescuing her faithful Zoda from the clutches of the unbeliever who defamed her fair beauty. No, Zoda, your Issus is a mortal old woman, once out of her clutches and she cannot harm you. With your knowledge of this strange land, and my knowledge of the outer world, two such fighting men as you and I should be able to win our way to freedom. Even though we died in the attempt, would not our memories be fairer than as though we remained in servile fear to be butchered by a cruel and unjust tyrant? Call her goddess or mortal, as you will. As I finished, I raised Xoda to his feet and released him. He did not renew the attack upon me, nor did he speak. Instead, he walked toward the bench, and sinking down upon it, remained lost in deep thought for hours. A long time afterward, I heard a soft sound at the doorway leading to one of the other apartments, and looking up, beheld the red Martian youth gazing intently at us. Kor, I cried, after the red Martian manner of greeting. Kao, he replied. What do you hear? I await my death, I presume. I replied with a wry smile. He too smiled, a brave and winning smile. I also, he said, mine will come soon. I looked upon the radiant beauty of Issus nearly a year since. It has always been a source of keen wonder to me that I did not drop dead at the first sight of that hideous countenance and her belly by my first ancestor, but never was there so grotesque a figure in all the universe that they should call such a one goddess of life eternal, goddess of death, mother of the nearer moon, and fifty other equally impossible titles, is quite beyond me. How came you here? I asked. It is very simple. I was flying a one-man air scout far to the south when the brilliant idea occurred to me that I should like to search for the lost sea of Chorus, which tradition places near to the South Pole. I must have inherited from my father a wild lust for adventure, as well as a hollow where my bump of reverence should be. I had reached the area of eternal ice when my port propeller jammed, and I dropped to the ground to make repairs. Before I knew it, the air was black with flyers, and a hundred of these first-born devils were leaping to the ground all about me. With drawn swords they made for me, but before I went down beneath them, they had tasted of the steel of my father's sword, and I had given such an account of myself as I know would have pleased my sire had he lived to witness it. Your father is dead, I asked. He died before the shell broke to let me step out into a world that has been very good to me, but for the sorrow that I had never the honor to know my father, I have been very happy. My only sorrow now is that my mother must mourn me, as she has for ten long years mourned my father. Who was your father? I asked. He was about to reply when the outer door of our prison opened, and a burly guard entered and ordered him to his own quarters for the night, locking the door after him as he passed through into the further chamber. It is Issus's wish that you two be confined in the same room, said the guard when he had returned to our cell. This cowardly slave of a slave is to serve you well, he said to me, indicating Zodar with a wave of his hand. If he does not, you are to beat him into submission. It is Issus's wish that you heap upon him every indignity and degradation of which you can conceive. With these words, he left us. Zodar still sat with his face buried in his hands. I walked to his side and placed my hand upon his shoulder. Zodar, I said, you have heard the commands of Issus, but you need not fear that I shall attempt to put them into execution. You are a brave man, Zodar. It is your own affair if you wish to be persecuted and humiliated. But were I you, I should assert my manhood and defy my enemies. I have been thinking very hard, John Carter, he said, of all the new ideas you gave me a few hours since. Little by little, I have been piecing together the things that you said, which sounded blasphemous to me then, with the things that I have seen in my past life, 
and dared not even think about for fear of bringing down upon me the wrath of Issus. I believe now that she is a fraud, no more divine than you or I. More I am willing to concede, that the firstborn are no holier than the holy therns, nor the holy therns more holy than the red men. The whole fabric of our religion is based on superstitious belief in lies that have been foisted upon us for ages by those directly above us, to whose personal profit and aggrandizement it was to have us continue to believe as they wished us to believe. I am ready to cast off the ties that have bound me. I am ready to defy Issus herself, but what will it avail us? Be the firstborn gods or mortals, they are a powerful race, and we are as fast in their clutches as though we were already dead. There is no escape. I have escaped from bad plights in the past, my friend, I replied. Nor while life is in me shall I despair of escaping from the Isle of Shada and the Sea of Amen. But we cannot escape even from the four walls of our prison, urged Zodar. Test this flint-like surface, he cried, smiting the solid rock that confined us. And look upon this polished surface. None could cling to it to reach the top. I smiled. That is the least of our troubles, Exodar, I replied. I will guarantee to scale the wall and take you with me if you will help with your knowledge of the customs here to appoint the best time for the attempt and guide me to the shaft that lets from the dome of this abysmal sea to the light of God's pure air above. Night time is the best and offers the only slender chance we have, for then men sleep and only a dozing watch nods in the tops of the battleships. No watch is kept upon the cruisers and smaller craft. The watchers upon the larger vessels see to all about them. It is night now. But, I exclaimed, it is not dark. How can it be night then? He smiled. You forget, he said, that we are far below ground. The light of the sun never penetrates here. There are no moons and no stars reflected in the bosom of Omean. The phosphorescent light you now see pervading this great subterranean vault emanates from the rocks that form its dome. It is always thus upon Omean, just as the billows are always as you see them, rolling, ever rolling over a windless sea. At the appointed hour of night upon the world above, the men whose duties hold them here sleep, but the light is ever the same. It will make escape more difficult, I said, and then I shrugged my shoulders. For what, pray, is the pleasure of doing an easy thing? Let us sleep on it tonight, said Zodar. A plan may come with our awakening. So we threw ourselves upon the hard stone floor of our prison and slept the sleep of tired men. Chapter 11 When Hell Broke Loose Early the next morning, Zodar and I commenced work upon our plans for escape. First, I had him sketch upon the stone floor of our cell as accurate a map of the South Polar regions as was possible with the crude instruments at our disposal, a buckle from my harness and the sharp edge of the wondrous gem I had taken from Sator Throg. From this, I computed the general direction of helium and the distance at which it lay from the opening which led to Omean. Then I had him draw a map of Omean, indicating plainly the position of Shadda and of the opening in the dome which led to the outer world. These I studied until they were indelibly imprinted in my memory. From Zodar I learned the duties and customs of the guards who patrolled Shador. It seemed that during the hours set aside for sleep, only one man was on duty at a time. He paced a beat that passed around the prison at a distance of about a hundred feet from the building. The pace of the sentries, Zodar said, was very slow, requiring nearly ten minutes to make a single round. This meant that for practically five minutes at a time, each side of the prison was unguarded as the sentry pursued his snail-like pace upon the opposite side. This information, you ask, said Zodar, will be all very valuable after we get out, but nothing that you have asked has any bearing on that first and most important consideration. We will get out all right, I replied, laughing. Leave that to me. When shall we make the attempt? He asked. The first night that finds a small craft moored near the shore of Shador, I replied. 
But how will you know that any craft is moored near Shador? The windows are far beyond our reach. Not so, friend Zodar, look. With a bound, I sprang to the bars of the window opposite us and took a quick survey of the scene without. Several small craft and two large battleships lay within a hundred yards of Shador. Tonight, I thought, and was just about to voice my decision to Zodar when, without warning, the door of our prison opened and a guard stepped in. If the fellow saw me there, our chances of escape might quickly go glimmering, for I knew that they would put me in irons if they had the slightest conception of the wonderful agility which my earthly muscles gave me upon Mars. The man had entered and was standing facing the center of the room so that his back was toward me. Five feet above me was the top of a partition wall separating our cell from the next. There was my only chance to escape detection. If the fellow turned, I was lost, nor could I have dropped to the floor undetected, since he was so nearly below me that I would have struck him had I done so. Where is the white man? cried the guard of Zodar. Issus commands his presence. He started to turn to see if I were in another part of the cell. I scrambled up the iron grating of the window until I could catch a good footing on the sill with one foot, then I let go my hold and sprang for the partition top. What was that? I heard the deep voice of the black bellow as my metal grated against the stone wall as I slipped over. Then I dropped lightly to the floor of the cell beyond. Where is the white slave? again cried the guard. I know not, replied Zoda. He was here even as you entered. I am not his keeper. Go find him. The black grumbled something that I could not understand, and then I heard him unlocking the door into one of the other cells on the further side. Listening intently, I caught the sound as the door closed behind him. Then I sprang once more to the top of the partition and dropped into my own cell beside the astonished Xodar. Do you see now how we will escape? I asked him in a whisper. I see how you may, he replied, but I am no wiser than before as to how I am to pass these walls. Certain it is that I cannot bounce over them as you do. We heard the guard moving about from cell to cell, and finally, his rounds completed, he again entered ours. When his eyes fell upon me, they fairly bulged from his head. By the shell of my first ancestor, he roared, where have you been? I have been in prison since you put me here yesterday, I answered. I was in this room when you entered. You had better look to your eyesight. He glared at me in mingled rage and relief. Come, he said. Issus commands your presence. He conducted me outside the prison, leaving Zodar behind. There we found several other guards, and with them the red Martian youth who occupied another cell upon Shadda. The journey I had taken to the Temple of Issus on the preceding day was repeated. The guards kept the red boy and myself separated, so that we had no opportunity to continue the conversation that had been interrupted the previous night. The youth's face had haunted me. Where had I seen him before? There was something strangely familiar in every line of him, in his carriage, his manner of speaking, his gestures. I could have sworn that I knew him, and yet I knew too that I had never seen him before. When we reached the gardens of Issus, we were led away from the temple instead of toward it. The way wound through enchanted parks to a mighty wall that towered a hundred feet in air. Massive gates gave egress upon a small plain surrounded by the same gorgeous forests that I had seen at the foot of the Golden Cliffs. Crowds of blacks were strolling in the same direction that our guards were leading us and with them mingled my old friends, the plant men, and great white apes. The brutal beasts moved among the crowd as pet dogs might. If they were in the way, the blacks pushed them roughly to one side, or whacked them with the flat of a sword, and the animals slunk away as in great fear. Presently, we came upon our destination, a great amphitheater situated at the further edge of the plain, and about half a mile beyond the garden walls. Through a massive arched gateway, the blacks poured in to take their seats, while our guards led us to a smaller entrance near one end of the structure. Through this we passed into an enclosure beneath the seats, where we found a number of other prisoners herded together under guard. 
Some of them were in irons, but for the most part, they seemed sufficiently awed by the presence of their guards to preclude any possibility of attempted escape. During the trip from Shadow, I had had no opportunity to talk with my fellow prisoner, but now that we were safely within the barred paddock, our guards abated their watchfulness, with the result that I found myself able to approach the red Martian youth for whom I felt such a strange attraction. What is the object of this assembly? I asked him. Are we to fight for the edification of the firstborn, or is it something worse than that? It is a part of the monthly rites of Issus, he replied, in which black men wash the sins from their souls in the blood of men from the outer world. If, perchance, the black is killed, it is evidence of his disloyalty to Issus, the unpardonable sin. If he lives through the contest, he is held acquitted of the charge that forced the sentence of the rites as it is called upon him. The forms of combat vary. A number of us may be pitted together against an equal number or twice the number of blacks. Or singly, we may be sent forth to face wild beasts or some famous black warrior. And if we are victorious, I asked, what then? Freedom, he laughed. Freedom, forsooth, the only freedom for us death. None who enters the domains of the firstborn ever leave. If we prove able fighters, we are permitted to fight often. If we are not mighty fighters, he shrugged his shoulders. Sooner or later, we die in the arena. And you have fought often, I asked. Very often, he replied. It is my only pleasure. Some hundred black devils have I accounted for during nearly a year of the rites of Issus. My mother would be very proud could she only know how well I have maintained the traditions of my father's prowess. Your father must have been a mighty warrior, I said. I have known most of the warriors of Barsoom in my time. Doubtless I knew him. Who was he? My father was... Come, Callots, cried the rough voice of a guard. To the slaughter with you! And roughly, we were hustled to the steep incline that led to the chambers far below, which let out upon the arena. The amphitheatre, like all I had ever seen upon Barsoom, was built in a large excavation. Only the highest seats, which formed the low wall surrounding the pit, were above the level of the ground. The arena itself was far below the surface. Just beneath the lowest tier of seats was a series of barred cages on a level with the surface of the arena. Into these we were herded. But unfortunately, my youthful friend was not of those who occupied a cage with me. Directly opposite my cage was the throne of Issus. Here, the horrid creature squatted, surrounded by a hundred slave maidens sparkling in jeweled trappings. Brilliant cloths of many hues and strange patterns formed the soft cushion covering of the dais upon which they reclined about her. On four sides of the throne, and several feet below it, stood three solid ranks of heavily armed soldiery, elbow to elbow. In front of these were the high dignitaries of this mock heaven, gleaming blacks bedecked with precious stones, upon their foreheads the insignia of their rank set in circles of gold. On both sides of the throne stretched a solid mass of humanity from top to bottom of the amphitheatre. There were as many women as men, and each was clothed in the wondrously wrought harness of his station and his house. With each black was from one to three slaves, drawn from the domains of the therns and from the outer world. The blacks are all noble. There is no peasantry among the firstborn. Even the lowest soldier is a god and has his slaves to wait upon him. The firstborn do no work. The men fight. That is a sacred privilege and duty, to fight and die for Issus. The women do nothing, absolutely nothing. Slaves wash them, slaves dress them, slaves feed them. There are some, even, who have slaves that talk for them, and I saw one who sat during the rites with closed eyes, while a slave narrated to her the events that were transpiring within the arena. The first event of the day was the tribute to Issus. It marked the end of those poor unfortunates who had looked upon the divine glory of the goddess a full year before. There were ten of them, splendid beauties from the proud courts of mighty Jeddaks and from the temples of the Holy Therns. For a year they had served in the retinue of Issus. 
Today, they were to pay the price of this divine preferment with their lives. Tomorrow, they would grace the tables of the court functionaries. A huge black entered the arena with the young women. Carefully, he inspected them, felt of their limbs, and poked them in the ribs. Presently, he selected one of their number, whom he led before the throne of Issus. He addressed some words to the goddess which I could not hear. Issus nodded her head. The black raised his hands above his head in token of salute, grasped the girl by the wrist, and dragged her from the arena through a small doorway below the throne. Issus will dine well tonight, said a prisoner beside me. What do you mean? I asked. That was her dinner that old Tharbis is taking to the kitchens. Didst not note how carefully he selected the plumpest and tenderest of the lot. I growled out my curses on the monster sitting opposite us on the gorgeous throne. Fume not, admonished my companion. You will see far worse than that if you live even a month among the firstborn. I turned again in time to see the gate of a nearby cage thrown open and three monstrous white apes spring into the arena. The girls shrank in a frightened group in the center of the enclosure. One was on her knees with imploring hands outstretched toward Issus, but the hideous deity only leaned further forward in keener anticipation of the entertainment to come. At length, the apes spied the huddled knot of terror-stricken maidens and with demoniacal shrieks of bestial frenzy charged upon them. A wave of mad fury surged over me. The cruel cowardliness of the power-drunk creature whose malignant mind conceived such frightful forms of torture stirred to their uttermost depths my resentment and my manhood. The blood-red haze that presaged death to my foes swam before my eyes. The guard lolled before the unbarred gate of the cage which confined me. What need of bars, indeed, to keep those poor victims from rushing into the arena which the edict of the gods had appointed as their death place? A single blow sent the black unconscious to the ground. Snatching up his long sword, I sprang into the arena. The apes were almost upon the maidens, but a couple of mighty bounds were all my earthly muscles required to carry me to the center of the sand-strewn floor. For an instant, silence reigned in the great amphitheater. Then a wild shout arose from the cages of the doomed. My long sword circled, whirring through the air, and a great ape sprawled, headless, at the feet of the fainting girls. The other apes turned now upon me, and as I stood facing them, a sullen roar from the audience answered the wild cheers from the cages. From the tail of my eye, I saw a score of guards rushing across the glistening sand toward me. Then a figure broke from one of the cages behind them. It was the youth whose personality so fascinated me. He paused a moment before the cages with upraised sword. Come, men of the outer world, he shouted. Let us make our deaths worthwhile and at the back of this unknown warrior turn this day's tribute to Issus into an orgy of revenge that will echo through the ages and cause black skins to blanch at each repetition of the rites of Issus. Come! The racks without your cages are filled with blades. Without waiting to note the outcome of his plea, he turned and bounded toward me. From every cage that harbored red men, a thunderous shout went up in answer to his exhortation. The inner guards went down beneath howling mobs, and the cages vomited forth their inmates hot with the lust to kill. The racks that stood without were stripped of the swords with which the prisoners were to have been armed to enter their allotted combats, and a swarm of determined warriors sped to our support. The great apes, towering in all their fifteen feet of height, had gone down before my sword, while the charging guards were still some distance away. Close behind them pursued the youth, at my back were the young girls, and as it was in their service that I fought, I remained standing there to meet my inevitable death, but with the determination to give such an account of myself as would long be remembered in the land of the firstborn. I noted the marvelous speed of the young red man as he raced after the guards. Never had I seen such speed in any Martian. His leaps and bounds were little short of those which my earthly muscles had produced to create such awe and respect 
on the part of the green Martians into whose hands I had fallen on that long-gone day that had seen my first advent upon Mars. The guards had not reached me when he fell upon them from the rear, and as they turned, thinking from the fierceness of his onslaught that a dozen were attacking them, I rushed them from my side. In the rapid fighting that followed, I had little chance to note aught else than the movements of my immediate adversaries, but now and again I caught a fleeting glimpse of a purring sword and a lightly springing figure of sinewy steel that filled my heart with a strange yearning and a mighty but unaccountable pride. On the handsome face of the boy a grim smile played, and ever and anon he threw a taunting challenge to the foes that faced him. In this and other ways his manner of fighting was similar to that which had always marked me on the field of combat. Perhaps it was this vague lightness which made me love the boy, while the awful havoc that his sword played amongst the blacks filled my soul with a tremendous respect for him. For my part, I was fighting as I had fought a thousand times before, now sidestepping a wicked thrust, now stepping quickly in to let my sword's point drink deep in a foeman's heart before it buried itself in the throat of his companion. We were having a merry time of it, we too, when a great body of Issus's own guards were ordered into the arena. On they came with fierce cries, while from every side the armed prisoners swarmed upon them. For half an hour it was as though all hell had broken loose. In the walled confines of the arena, we fought in an inextricable mass, howling, cursing, blood-streaked demons, and ever the sword of the young red man flashed beside me. Slowly, and by repeated commands, I had succeeded in drawing the prisoners into a rough formation about us, so that at last we fought formed into a rude circle, in the centre of which were the doomed maids. Many had gone down on both sides, but by far the greater havoc had been wrought in the ranks of the guards of Issus. I could see messengers running swiftly through the audience, and as they passed the nobles, there unsheathed their swords and sprang into the arena. They were going to annihilate us by force of numbers, that was quite evidently their plan. I caught a glimpse of Issus leaning far forward upon her throne, her hideous countenance distorted in a horrid grimace of hate and rage in which I thought I could distinguish an expression of fear. It was that face that inspired me to the thing that followed. Quickly, I ordered fifty of the prisoners to drop back behind us and form a new circle about the maidens. Remain and protect them until I return, I commanded. Then, turning to those who formed the outer line, I cried, Down with Issus! Follow me to the throne! We will reap vengeance where vengeance is deserved! The youth at my side was the first to take up the cry of, Down with Issus! And then at my back and from all sides rose a hoarse shout, To the throne! To the throne! As one man we moved, an irresistible fighting mass, over the bodies of dead and dying foes toward the gorgeous throne of the Martian deity. Hordes of the doughtiest fighting men of the firstborn poured from the audience to check our progress. We mowed them down before us as they had been paper men. To the seats, some of you, I cried, as we approached the arena's barrier wall. Ten of us can take the throne, for I had seen that Issa's guards had for the most part entered the fray within the arena. On both sides of me, the prisoners broke to left and right for the seats, vaulting the low wall with dripping swords lusting for the crowded victims who awaited them. In another moment, the entire amphitheatre was filled with the shrieks of the dying and the wounded, mingled with the clash of arms and triumphant shouts of the victors. Side by side, the young red man and I, with perhaps a dozen others, fought our way to the foot of the throne. The remaining guards, reinforced by the high dignitaries and nobles of the firstborn, closed in between us and Issus, who sat leaning far forward upon her carved Serapis bench, now screaming high-pitched commands to her following, now hurling blighting curses upon those who sought to desecrate her godhood. The frightened slaves about her trembled in wide-eyed expectancy, knowing not whether to pray for our victory or our defeat. Several among them, proud daughters no doubt of some of Barsoom's noblest warriors, snatched swords from the hands of the fallen and fell upon the guards of Issus, but they were soon cut down. 
glorious martyrs to a hopeless cause. The men with us fought well, but never since Tars Tarkas and I fought out that long, hot afternoon shoulder to shoulder against the hordes of Warhoon in the dead sea bottom before Thark had I seen two men fight to such good purpose and with such unconquerable ferocity as the young red man and I fought that day before the throne of Issus, goddess of death and of life eternal. Man by man, those who stood between us and the carven Soropus wood bench went down before our blades. Others swarmed in to fill the breach, but inch by inch, foot by foot, we won nearer and nearer to our goal. Presently, a cry went up from a section of the stands nearby. Rise, slaves! Rise, slaves! It rose and fell until it swelled to a mighty volume of sound that swept in great billows around the entire amphitheatre. For an instant, as though by common assent, we ceased our fighting to look for the meaning of this new note, nor did it take but a moment to translate its significance. In all parts of the structure, the female slaves were falling upon their masters with whatever weapon came first to hand. A dagger snatched from the harness of her mistress was waved aloft by some fair slave, its shimmering blade crimson with the lifeblood of its owner. Swords plucked from the bodies of the dead about them, heavy ornaments which could be turned into bludgeons. Such were the implements with which these fair women wreaked the long-pent vengeance which at best could but partially recompense them for the unspeakable cruelties and indignities which their black masters had heaped upon them. And those who could find no other weapons used their strong fingers and their gleaming teeth. It was at once a sight to make one shudder and to cheer, but in a brief second we were engaged once more in our own battle with only the unquenchable battle cry of the women to remind us that they still fought. Rise, slaves! Rise, slaves! Only a single thin rank of men now stood between us and Issus. Her face was blue with terror. Foam flecked her lips. She seemed too paralyzed with fear to move. Only the youth and I fought now. The others all had fallen, and I was like to have gone down too from a nasty long sword cut, had not a hand reached out from behind my adversary and clutched his elbow as the blade was falling upon me. The youth sprang to my side and ran his sword through the fellow before he could recover to deliver another blow. I should have died even then, but for that as my sword was tight wedged in the breastbone of a dater of the firstborn. As the fellow went down, I snatched his sword from him, and over his prostrate body looked into the eyes of the one whose quick hand had saved me from the first cut of his sword. It was Fidor, daughter of Matai Shang. Fly, my prince, she cried. It is useless to fight them longer. All within the arena are dead. All who charge the throne are dead, but you and this youth. Only among the seats are there left any of your fighting men, and they and the slave women are fast being cut down. Listen, you can scarce hear the battle cry of the women now, for nearly all are dead. For each one of you, there are ten thousand blacks within the domains of the firstborn. Break for the open and the sea of chorus. With your mighty sword arm, you may yet win to the golden cliffs and the templed gardens of the holy therns. There tell your story to Matai Shang, my father. He will keep you, and together you may find a way to rescue me. Fly while there is yet a bare chance for flight. But that was not my mission, nor could I see much to be preferred in the cruel hospitality of the Holy Therns to that of the firstborn. Down with Issus, I shouted, and together the boy and I took up the fight once more. Two blacks went down with our swords in their vitals, and we stood face to face with Issus. As my sword went up to end her horrid career, her paralysis left her, and with an ear-piercing shriek she turned to flee. Directly behind her, a black gulf suddenly yawned in the flooring of the dais. She sprang for the opening with the youth, and I close at her heels. Her scattered guard rallied at her cry and rushed for us. A blow fell upon the head of the youth. He staggered and would have fallen, but I caught him in my left arm and turned to face an infuriated mob of religious fanatics, crazed by the affront I had put upon their goddess, just as Issus disappeared into the black depths beneath me. 
Hey, sci-fi horror fans, that concludes part one of The Gods of Mars. Make sure to subscribe so you won't miss part two, which will come out next Saturday, October 7th. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up. A huge shout out goes to our official members of the channel. We appreciate you all. Craving for another classic sci-fi tale? Click that video on your screen. Until next time, everyone. And remember, stay cosmic.